Hey guys, it's Emily, and you are about to watch about the two, two and a half hour conversation that I had last week with FPV Angel and One Conscience of the Angelic Particle Matrix Research Team Collective. Um, for those of you who follow my work, you have heard me refer to them uh, repetitively over the course of at least the last year, maybe as much as the last year and a half. And we've been trying to work out a, a conversation uh, for some time. I'd had a private conversation with FPV uh, quite some time back, um, but we wanted to try and get a few of them together so we could have like more of a round table. The way it actually worked out is uh, for the first about hour and a half or so, it's just myself and FPV and then One Conscience joined us and we had a conversation for about another hour. Um, this in no way is a replacement for going to their channel and checking out their work. They have uh, an absolutely extensive and thorough uh, amount of work they have done on what, you know, the, the, the construct that we live in, the, the, you know, this place that, that we live and that we're all trying to understand so that we can understand who we are and what our place is in that. And this was just a short conversation of me asking questions that I have about their work, looking for feedback. I have used a lot of things that I have learned from them over the last year and a half to help me understand um, my reality, my journey. And um, I, you know, I really admire them and their work. I do not claim on any level to have a complete understanding of it. Um, I think I could spend like all the hours of the day there and, and still just be scratching the surface of the things that they have both uncovered and then taken the time to put together in a way that makes it not only informative, but also beautiful. So um, I hope you all will uh, enjoy this conversation, but more importantly, go over and check out their work. All of their work is available on the FPV Angel YouTube channel, which is linked down below. I've decided to make the entire conversation publicly available because of how important I think their work is. Um, I've spent a tremendous amount of time sitting with the ideas that they've presented over the course of the last year, and it has greatly affected the way um, that I view things. And I was really honored uh, to finally get to have the conversation on air. So um, stick around, listen. If you enjoy it, uh, consider becoming uh, a patron at patreon.com forward slash off planet media or emilymoyer.locals.com. Um, I use uh, a lot of the things I've learned from them in my work, and I hope I do their work uh, justice, and I hope to continue to learn from them. I will link to their channel and to some of the videos that they mentioned over the course of the conversation in the description box below. The conversation was an audio-only conversation. However, both they and I did use screen share, so I'm putting it out you know, in a video format, even though none of us are necessarily uh, on camera for the video. Um, and I think that's it. I'm recording this little clip here on Friday. This uh, episode is premiering. If you're watching it right now, you're watching the premiere at one o'clock central on Saturday. Um, I'm premiering it so we can have some discussion in the chat room. Hopefully some of the members of the their group will be able to show up and converse with all of us. There are several members that contribute to their research. This conversation is just with FPV and One Conscience. Uh, I hope you enjoy FPV Angel. One Conscience, Sandra, all the rest of the team over there. Thank you so much for uh, expanding my my view of things and um, helping me to understand the the world and myself uh, better through your work. All right, guys, here we go. Enjoy angelic particle matrix research. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Emily Moyer, and today is a special day because this one has been in the making for probably a year and a half or so at this point. I'm honored to be joined by FPV Angel from Angel Particle Matrix Research, uh, One Conscience and uh, Cool Picks, I think is uh, what she goes by publicly, maybe joining us here in a little bit, but we decided not to wait since we have limited time. So FPV and I are gonna get started. Uh, at long last, welcome, how are you? Hello, Emily. <laughs> 
Yeah, it has been a long time, at least a year plus anyway, that I can remember since we last spoke. So, yeah, it's nice to be here and nice to be discussing this research and good to see that you're incorporating it into your own research and it's making some sense to you. Yeah, so I met you um, and just had a private chat with you and Sandra, you know, about a year ago now, which is crazy that that so much time has passed um, and it just hasn't, you know, because of time difference and everybody has their own schedule and so many people are part of what you do. It just hasn't worked out to do a proper recording, but today it did at the last minute. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that. And, um, you know, in some ways it's probably good. We do it now instead of back a year ago, because the longer, you know, you sit with the information, the, the more sense it starts to make and the more levels it makes sense on. Right. Yeah. And so I think like my brain, had a certain understanding of it um, immediately because it, it there was enough. I mean, I haven't obviously seen everything you've done because you guys do 120 hour live streams six times a week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I've seen, you know, I watched in the beginning quite a bit and, you know, I have a good intuitor. And so some of it is just my brain naturally is able to pick up on things without having to have the whole thing explain to me so I spent a lot of time and then now sometimes I'll just pop in even for a few minutes just to get little bits and pieces but I don't think I understood it in my like body my spirit my soul all the different levels in the beginning just my brain got it and like maybe my some like metaphysical like analytical part of myself got it but now I really see and feel and understand sort of I think I do at least anyway, how it works, how we're, how we are sort of completely surrounded by it, it where it's something we're inside of something that we're part of and something that is us on a level that like, you just can't grok that as soon as you find out about the information. Right. So yeah. I'm glad I've had some time to sit with it. So um, for some people who listen to my channel, this is going to be their first time exposed uh, to you and and you've been doing this for a long time now so um, I'm sure your ability to explain it in a way you know sort of that grabs people and encourages them to come over and take the deeper look ha has gotten to a, a, a higher level than it probably was in the beginning when you're like fuck how do I explain this to somebody um, mm -hmm. so why don't you just for anybody who has not looked into your research just kind of you know it's, it feels ridiculous to say this, but this is the world we live in. If you met me in a bar and we were having a whiskey, how would you start this? How would you start the conversation? <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part, isn't it? You know, you got to reach everyone's knowledge base and interests. And, and most of what we put out by now should resonate with some people, whatever you've looked into, whether it be, you know, geoglyphs, petroglyphs, sacred geometry, structures, buildings, <laughs> lunar, you know, all kinds of things that we've looked into over the years. And it's hooking it all into one big picture. That's the hard part to show people this is actually one. It's all part of the same thing. You know, this is the conclusions you come to. Wait a minute, all this rolls in together into one big, very big picture that becomes clearer and clearer. So for all your viewers or anyone listening, what we did after we found Flat Earth, my avenue of research was basically, okay, if mainstream are lying, what are those lights in the sky? What's making them move? You know, what are the mechanisms behind this construct? If this is a construct, which is what my first thoughts were when I realized we don't live on a spinning ball, okay, we're looking at some kind of a construct that obviously has some kind of a creator. So what did they create that makes these lights move across the sky? So my avenue research straight away was we're looking at a technological construct. And at the time, I was looking at sacred geometry a lot, and the Nazca lines especially. I was, I was looking at those, and I was starting to realize what I was seeing as I was line tracing them in Google Earth. It was starting to form a bigger picture of what I was looking at. And I realized I'm looking at a very large set of blueprints. And I thought, Whoa, where do these go? What are these blueprints a part of? What is it? What's this I'm looking at? You know, everyone around the world, it doesn't matter what country you're from, they look at all these amazing structures around the world, all this sacred geometry, all these buildings, pyramids, you name it, and no one has a clue what they are or what they were, which is strange. That, that, that's, you know, there's a dark part in our history that's missing for all this information to just get lost like that. You don't just forget things like that. You don't build something like that and then forget what it represents, do you? So it's all got special meaning. And my research was putting this meaning back together So because I thought, okay, what I've been taught at school isn't going to help me 
decoding this construct. So I've got to throw a lot away and start again. So I, what were the ancients teaching? So we'll look at the ancients and you know, geometry, sacred geometry, knowledge, um, prophecies, holy books. We, we, we've been down that, that many avenues, it's impossible to name them all. Uh, you, you know, you'd have to go through our videos to see all the avenues we look down where we can link parts of what we look at into a working mechanism of this construct. And that's what we've been doing for the past five years, working out how this construct works, what its mechanisms are, how we can see and prove it into the real world, which is where we've been, you know, we've been trying to tell people this for five years now, what to look for. And it does get a bit easier and easier to word. You know, a few years ago, putting this into words was really impossible for me because I was having to learn new terminology to explain what I was trying to tell people. Termin you know, terminology I hadn't learned before and science I'd never really took an interest before, but now it all starts to come together and make more sense. In fact, the easiest way of looking at it now is looking at, say, our group as being the best explanation you're probably ever going to find for what this world is and how it works and use that in your favor to learn from us where pieces of the jigsaw you've got will plug back into where it belongs, which is what you're kind of doing now. You're now researching, I noticed your last video, you're researching an area of a map. And I did leave you some comments there and tips what to look for. So, you know, it's finding your interests. What, what can we prove to you that you can prove to yourself that we're telling you the truth? is where we're at. How can we prove where this technology is and where we can show people, you can go out there, record it, see it for yourself, and look at our interpretation of it and where it fits in in this big picture, which will be scriptural or biblical, however you want to word it. Uh, while we're on the biblical or scriptural thing, none of that relates to religion. Reality is not a religion. Your holy books, your creation stories, all these things like that, they're here to define and tell you how this world works. Now, what man has done to corrupt that is change technologies. They've person what they've done is personify these technologies. So they've called them like saints and given them an image and a name. So you bring that image to life in a book as a person, because you've now you no, no longer have the glyphs that represent what it's telling you. That's why I prefer working with sacred geometry, because you've got the glyphs. And you've got the story, so there could be no confusion whatsoever what the story is talking about. Now, with holy books, that image, those images have been taken away. So you can see what they've done there. In the ancient times, we used glyphs and stories to tell you what the glyphs were telling you. Modern times, you've got a book, very minimal pictures in it. You have no idea what it's talking about. You can see how easy it is to lose people. You, know, they can, you can hide this technology by giving it a name, put it in a book and people bring that to life as a character. So what we're doing is putting it back into a digital context. Which, you know, we, we're going past what it's telling you in the book. People assume it's all about people. We're not saying people didn't exist in ancient times. You know, the names they used in these holy books do come from somewhere. Now, where? I've no idea. But they were obviously used in their times. So the names probably existed. We're not saying that people didn't exist. We're saying what they're referring to is actually technologies in the underworld that are the mechanisms of this construct and not actually people who they might have been named after at the time. But as you look at different cultures and religions, you find they've all got different names, but it's still for the same thing. They've just got a different name for the same process or, or term uh, technology, because that's what we're looking at, you know, a technological construct and how it works. So a lot of these special names have got different names in different locations of the world, but they're still relating to the same technology. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, no, I mean, it makes perfect sense. And, and even since I spoke to you last year, it, it gets more concise all the time, right? I think I get better in my explanation of it. You certainly have gotten really good at being able to, you know, give the sort of digestible explanation of it. But yeah, I mean, that makes the most sense to me, right? I mean. So yeah. when I first, uh, I, I was referred to your work from a John Levi video and I went over there and within a few minutes, like I, it, it was speaking to me because of the fact that I recognized the imagery. I recognized the imagery, some of it from some of my studies into sacred geometry, because that to me as well, of all the things that I've discovered um, on my sort of, you know, awakening, truth, whatever you want to call it, journey, right? My vision quest, whatever. 
Like that's given, that's kind of been the, the one constant that's always been there, like regardless of wherever I am in my beliefs about reality at the time, that the geometry is this is generally the same. It has the least amount of, and trust me, there are, you know this, there are people who try to make a religion of it, but if you can separate out the actual structures and functions from the personalities that have become associated with teaching it, then you know you you generally can can find a pretty good track to go down. So obviously, I was recognizing that you were you know using the sacred geometry to explain your ideas and whatnot. But I also then saw some. And by the way, your graphics are amazing, and I think you do most of them. Am I correct about that? Uh, it depends which uh, clips we're working on. In my own, I do use my own where I can, but uh, sometimes Sandra and Sandra's husband uh, does make some for me as well. Okay. You know, they've all, we've all got different skill sets. We can all use that software, uh, but sometimes I'll, I'll ask um, Sandra or her husband to do a certain piece for me while I'm, you know, doing this uh, speech for it. And, you know, because I'll, I'll know they'll probably do a better job at that part of it than I will because I'm rushing around and trying to get my bits done and juggle other people's bits and pieces in as well. So I don't always get the time to play on my animations as much as I used to. Okay. But, so but you know, we are, we're, we're all capable of doing them. You guys make a lot of your own graphics as opposed to using other, I know you use some graphics that are out there, but part of what I like yeah. about your research is there's obviously a lot of um, unique to your work graphics that you all have generated. And when I looked at them, I, they, there was a feeling of familiarity because these were things I had seen in my mind's eye. So whether or not like they were something that was the truth, they resonated enough with my truth that it had my attention immediately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's how it works, Emily, isn't it? You know, we can yeah. we can give you an animation and give you the proper terminology and wording that came with it. You know, like as, as an example, say the the volcano decoding, the angels decoded video, and we're using a break. I'm breaking down a Walter Russell image of where he, you know, he's got these vortexes going in and out the ground, which is, of course, you're only seeing half the picture with a tornado. Same as a rainbow. You know, we're seeing half of the picture when we're on the surface. Because there's another half below the ground that's kind of a, a mirror image, the duality that um, all your books speak of. So the duality is it's between the above and the below. You know, as above, so below comes into it there. So you know, people like you will will get it faster. You know, I can recognise that you get it faster because you've got that kind of mind. You, you you've already been going down these routes yourself. You know, searching for answers, and you've got a very active mind that knows bullshit when it sees it and. You, when you find something good you can get your teeth into, you'll you'll chase it up and you follow it, which is what you're doing now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things that happened, I started watching and I started to, um, you know, we all have like a, a story we understand about the world and then like a story we tell ourselves about ourselves, right? To help us make it through this experience. And yeah. for me, one of the things that was like, no, like this is, this is the way, this, this is the thing that's supposed to help me understand my reality was just, you know, and this has guided a lot of my journey is for some odd reason that I do not completely understand, but I have a pretty good intuitive understanding of, you know, I was in a movie about Judy Garland when I was a kid and Judy Garland, of course, sang the song Rainbow in, when she was in Wizard of Oz, she was Dorothy, right? And, you know, this sort of was the, part of the setup for some of the like MKUltra and Wizard of Oz type of programming that has always been present in my life. And I was like, you know, there is the completely controlled, you know, sort of darker nefarious aspect of that experience. And then there's always a truth to it, right? And so yeah. this is the flip side of that. And I have, I think maybe a unique um, either potential or ability to understand some of this based on where I've been and, 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 and the, the roles I have played per se, right? And then I also was a person who was raised not with religion. And so I've always tried to understand like, what is it about these books that make people act so crazy, dude? Because it seems crazy to someone who's raised without religion, right? When I started to really get into nutrition and the esoteric aspects of wellness and anatomy and stuff, I came to realize that the Bible and a lot of the scriptures and like the Bhagavad Gita and a lot of these, you know, ancient texts were really codes for how to take care of your body, how to manage your body. So when I heard you guys saying these ancient texts are basically an explanation of the mechanics of this 
technology that is the world we live in and how to manage it, how to ride its storms and waves and, and, and understand what's happening around you, it made perfect sense to me because I always understood that our bodies are a small version of the universe or of the, 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 the larger realm we find ourselves in. So I'm like, yeah, I mean, this is it. Like the, the, this book is, you know, and anyone can even look at their body and see what the spinal cord looks like and then go look at a linear particle accelerator and see that there's a similarity that is like undeniable, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so from there, it's like, okay, like it's, this is, information both for how to manage yourself and then how to manage your experience in this bigger reality that we're a part of that is us that um you know that is is really um the most important thing right everybody's running around like worried about the politics worried about whether they're going to be required to do this and that and all of this chaos that we live in is like a symptom of and a distraction from the necessity of this of this information and and that each one of us have to sort of understand it in a way unique to us right just like people whatever their belief is in in god or not i know you have members of your team who are you know religious and others who are not like nobody would say that their relationship with god or their understanding of god is exactly the same as someone else's Right. No, no, they find it quite different. <laughs> they, all, they all actually disagree with each other when you listen to them as well. They've all got their own version of what they think it means. Right. And so I feel like in some ways this is the same. Like what if we can understand some of the basic structures and, and parts of, 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 of the, the pieces of the puzzle here, like what we do with it, how we choose to explore it and understand it can be unique to each of us individually. And then we can talk about it. And and I think it's super fascinating. And, you know, if I had one thing to say to people, because I know people are, you know, at least most people who've been doing the research on different things for a long time, we're, we're consuming less information now than we used to. But in my opinion, this is the most useful because it's the one you can actually know for yourself, right? Like it's yeah, the, it, yeah. It's, you, yeah you, you know, you can reference it, can't you? You can go around and reference it, or you can go outside and measure it yourself. <laughs> You know, with this kind of research, you know, it's it's not it's, just, it's not fantasy. You can go outside, outside, you will catch halos in the sky, um, you know, like rainbows. You can start time lapse them now and see where they actually revolve, revolve where you see them. You know, we're getting lots and lots of different ways where we can point things out to people to people now and say, you know, that, that it lives there. It's, these reside there where you see them, and you time lapse it, you're going to find it, and we'll find different ways, more and more ways to add to that. Um, you know, going back to the the holy books. Um, we, when I look at holy books now, you know, us as a, us as a team, look at uh, holy books and, and you know creation stories. It's the it's basically the human's manual to the realm and how it works. Yep. It's not about religion or worship. There's no religion or worship we can see in there. It's science and knowledge is what this creator is teaching us. Now, there's a definition to be made here. God and the creator are two separate things. So what the what, the, what they've done with holy books is they've given you God, which your holy book will tell you is light. They've given you God to believe in, which then hides the creator and the construct of this, you know, this construct that we find ourselves living in. It's there now hidden. The creator and their construct are hidden and people are believing in what they call light. So that makes it easy for man to hide and steal the construct, which is where we really are. This is what's taken place. This They've been stealing this construct for uh, 2,000 years minimum. This has been going on for a few thousand years now. And, you know, they're just expanding out the way and taking more and more of it, taking over areas, countries. Uh, you know, the easiest way of showing you how it works, they'll send you to a country like, you know, mass immigration into this, into the United States or into Australia, New Zealand. And then you start voting in their system to, to put them there to control it. You've now stolen that nation from the indigenous populations that live there. That's what they've been doing. That's what they've used us for. And that's what they're going to use other races for. You know, when you work out how they've done this, how they've taken over the world just about and got it to such a point now where you've got adults waiting for, to be told what to do, looking at a screen. It's ridiculous. What, how do we get into this position? where we're just sitting there waiting to be told what to do by a television. You're adults. Act like that. You know, your children are looking up to you. 
they're terrified of what's going on today. And you need to get a, get a grip. You know, as far as we're concerned, you need to be in survival mode now. This construct has got its own mechanisms that are going to go into a reset. And these people are going to make that a lot more painful than it needs to be. The work, what they do with food and everything. And, of course, these pandemics and such that's going on. You know, this is them trying to make things worse for survivors of what's coming. So, okay, so, so you, you know, we're, we're getting into sort of the, the meat of the issue here. And so one of the things people who, who pay attention to your work will start to pick up on right away is how central particle accelerators are. So like in your model of, of things, right, this would be like the structure or, or sort of the backbone, right, of this entire realm. Can you, you know, and, and you sort of make a comparison or you literally say that what the Bible references as angels are really particle accelerators. Can you explain to people what particle accelerators are, where they come from, and what led, what, how you got to the space of understanding that that's what's being talked about in the Bible when they're talking about the 144,000 and whatnot? Yeah, brilliant question. <laughs> and, you know, explaining it does get easier and easier. So, like I said, you know, first thing people should think about here. Now, what is the creator's glory? Has that ever been defined to you what the glory actually is? No, it hasn't, has it? No one has been defined this glory or what it represents or what it even looks like. Yeah, we can see it's a glorious place to live, but we're still back to the same question. What is creating it? So then, you know, this is where my avenue was. I realized this technology is actually creating technology. It creates, maintains, and destroys by design. But by that, I mean... We'll take a, a tornado as an example. So it creates a field. It generates the field and keep and maintains it, which is you now your rotating torus field moving around, which is your tornado. That energy is getting transferred below as electrical voltage to the, to the angel technology below, which is a particle accelerator in modern terminology, and put to use and sent around the grid, which uses the ley lines. The ley lines is the network of them. This is how they interconnect. So the ley lines... And this, this technology are all interconnected below. That's why we call this, this model we're working with the angelic particle matrix, because we can see it's a, a matrix of technology that's all networked and, and working in sync. It's all, you know, they're all running on cycles. Switch on when the sun goes up, some of them switch on when the sun goes down. You know, this is how it works. These are, you know, we would transfer that as, uh, as quakes, quakes of this technology switching on and shut them down and doing what they do. Because when they collapse the field, you know, like I said, they create a field, they maintain it, and then they destroy it. Well, that destroyed field is what we would call lightning. That's it collapsing the field and, and harnessing that energy. All that electrical energy is going down to be harnessed somewhere and sent around the grid. So, you know, all of these running at once. I'm not saying they all run together at the same time. You know, as far as, far as we can see, some remain dormant for a long time. Then they start activating and coming on and doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is where we get with Operation Rainbow Warrior. You know, we want people to show us where the rainbows are, where to find them. And once we map them onto our map and grid, it'll give you a bigger idea of, you know, what the scale of this is and where they all are and what's going on. You know, be able to switch them on and off by, you know, Quake comes on, right, we can activate that one. We know that one's in use. So we get to the point where we explain, you know, why things, why Quakes are happening. You know, these are just activations and the activations and processes going on below that we experience as tornadoes, water spouts, earthquakes, volcanoes, and all the rest of it. This is the underworld working uh, I'm not sure where I was going, that because I can't remember now what the question was. <laughs> That's okay. I have another, uh, so, okay, so here's my question. So, are these are are these particle accelerators all like are some of them like part like are some of them or all of them part of the original design of what we call Earth or the realm? Did the creator build all of them and all of these sort of technology companies and weapons companies that tell us? that they, they run this or they build it? Are they really just building installations around them where they can experiment with them, monitor them, try to understand them? Or have they also begun trying to build them because they like to fancy themselves equal to the creator? Like how old are these particle accelerators? 
Are there new ones being built all the time or are they just being discovered and activated? Like what is the truth behind the particle accelerator industry? Well, you know, when we started looking into them, the first one we looked into was CERN and we could not find any evidence that of them actually building it, you know, like digging holes and tunnels and putting all this pipe work. And we couldn't find any proof that they were actually doing it. Now, I decoded CERN quite a few years ago as a polyon. I traced a polyon, which is Apollo, to CERN in Switzerland. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, I wasn't looking for that. I was just trying to decode words, you know, like, what's Apollo? Does that relate? Where is, it, where is this from? And you look at the terminology and the, the names and I traced it to somewhere in Switzerland. I thought, wow, that's probably Apollo. So these gods, you know, from the Greek times, Apollo, gods, so they, these are what they represent. So it's another way of finding this actually means this, you know, that's pointing to this. So even that, even there, even the Greeks are telling you this is this, this is where it is and this is where it lives. And then we go into how, how it all operates because, you know, they tell people the smashing particles into each other, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, if you look at it from Walter Russell's point of view and the way we translate Walter's work into a working construct using this technology, then it works perfectly because this is where your spirals come from. Ezekiel's wheel in a wheel would perfectly describe what you're seeing with the sun halo. If you look at the sun halo, it's a smaller wheel and a bigger wheel. You know, so it's a wheel in a wheel. So Ezekiel was trying to describe this technology. He just didn't have a name for it. And I'm pretty sure they, you know, they struggled to comprehend what they're looking at in those times. They probably understood it a lot better than we did or had it explained better, but we've never had it explained. So we're doing the explaining and trying to show you now how it works and where it factors in with real world science, which it does. All our sciences come from this. All roads lead to hiding this is what we, we know. So, you know, everything that they've done is to hide and conceal this so they can reverse engineer it, steal it. Now, they said there's 30,000 in the world that man's made. I would dispute that. I haven't seen evidence of them building one, to be honest. I wouldn't. Why would they need to build one when they're already here? So it's a case of the dressing them up, taking control, making a sarcophagi inside a sarcophagi, which means making a little office there that looks like theirs, but it's probably part of a bigger chamber that already existed there. You follow with the sarcophagi idea? Yep. This is what a sarcophagi represents. It represents a sealed room below. So any sarcophagi you see, Consider that now to represent, represent something very special below that's related to the workings of this construct, because that's what it's supposed to be. And you look in uh, some scriptures, and it'll mention in scriptures, uh, they were casting gold, made very ornate. You know, what's it talking about here? Well, look at the Tutankhamun, for instance. You know, th that's a king of that region. That's not a person. You know, let's, get this, let's get this right now. Kings and queens relate to this technology, not people. The royals are what you would consider this technology below, because there's, a, like I said, there's a hierarchy of them. You've got your kings, your queens, your princes, cherubims, seraphims. You know, there's a hierarchy there to be looking into, which we're going to get into now more in the next video. So, you know, the the, the sarcophagi of King Tutankhamun, as far as we're concerned, it's a technology below that plays a part in shepherding the luminaries across in that region. Does that make sense to you there? What we're, yeah. what we're saying there. Yeah. So are are the so the people that the the people that we consider royals that live on the surface of the earth are they just basically like the um, sort of a, an emblem or an ambassador or just a complete bullshit story to cover it up? Is it like this person is trying to channel the energy of this greater thing, and so they call themselves by that name? What? is the deal going on with these people running around saying they're important? Well, the best I can find on that, because I looked into that myself, you know, did kings, kings and queens exist in ancient times? And when I looked into the Native Americans, what they tell, they'll tell you themselves in their, I'm not sure which year we're looking at here, but, you know, a little bit back in time, they say kings and queens never existed in this world. So it wasn't that long ago that they didn't exist, according to the, like uh, whoever whichever the Native American tribe stated that. And I would believe that looking at what I'm seeing now. Now, we're, you know, there's two options here. You know, have we got imposters running around trying to 
So it's all, all about them when really it's about the technology below. Or do we have people that were voted into power to keep this truth and make sure it gets presented to the world all the time? You know, it's, it's this is every human being's right. It's your birthright to know this information. So is it, is it now being kept to a privileged few, this information, and it's filtered down and this is where we're at today. People scratch on their heads and they haven't got a clue what they're looking at anymore. But we have. We can see what we're looking at and we know what it relates to. And we can, you know, we can put that back into context and say, wait a minute, creator's glory is technology on a scale that's going to make your jaw drop. Can, they, can it make this world work? Yes, it's the only thing that can. Because what they're saying is a globe and all the science behind that doesn't work. It's, it's pseudoscience. It's absolute nonsense. The more you look into the globe, the more you're going to laugh, laugh at it yourself and, and think, how was I deceived so easily? So they took, you know, what they've done is taken away discernment. They take people's discernment from them. There's lots of ways they try and trick you to get you to think you live on a spinning ball. But we don't. <laughs> you know, it's, it's demonstrated. You can prove it yourself. There is no curvature out there. Aircraft do not adjust for curvature. I know that myself. I've flown two different types of aircraft. We do not adjust for curvature whatsoever in that sky. So it's level and stationary, which is what the NASA aircraft document tells you itself. Aircraft are designed to, to fly over a flat, non-rotating Earth. So there's some things they can't lie about when it comes to lives. They can lie about space as much as they like, but that, that's just stage acting, green screens, and all the rest of it. But when it comes to real-life aircraft, <laughs> they would be breaking the law by telling pilots to adjust for curvature, especially if it was foggy or mountainous, you know, cloud, fog. You're flying low. You haven't got a clue what angle. You need to know the attitude of your aircraft. And if you're following a curve, well, a curve's a ball. Eventually, the aircraft's going to reach the point of 40-degree pitch attitude. Your passengers are going to go into free fall. And then the globals will say, but gravity. Gravity does not nail you to the floor of an aircraft. Those people go into free fall. That should have alarm bells going. If you're trying to fly around a ball in an aircraft, those rear passengers are going to react, and they do react, as you've seen in the zero-G aircraft. They have no choice but to react. So you are not flying over a spinning ball. It'd be impossible. Well, you know, I won't, we won't talk about the ball too much because what we do is, you know, five years ago, we debunked the globe and we've moved on and decoding the constructs. So yeah. to me, to, you know, we're talking about old stuff there. <laughs> you know, flat Earth for us was five years ago. How yeah. it works is what's more important. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I've never been, uh, I would never say that I was a flat earther or not a flat earther. Um, it, like, you know, but if, if, I'm, if I'm going to be a flat earther, it has to be in service. Like it doesn't make, it, it seems unimportant to me if it's just, oh, the earth is flat and there's nothing else that, that has any effect on, right? There has to be um, a much deeper and more like far more in depth and like odd and esoteric explanation as to the why and the how of both why it is that way and b why they would tell you it's not that not that way in order for me to be interested in it right so yeah. like in, in for me i require the the explanation of the construct in order to care about whether the earth is flat or not right like yeah for me um so there's a couple of things like so okay so here's my question so Obviously, like just the other day, I was watching somebody, Mud Fossil University, do an interesting video about how this small tabletop particle accelerator has, you know, all of these abilities to do things in, you know, the medical field and whatever in the area that I grew up in, in Chatsworth, which I think we're going to, I'll talk, I'd like to talk with you about a little bit here in a little bit. Like there in Chatsworth, they have like a lot of companies that do like, linear tabletop particle accelerators for creation of like drugs and it, all this kind of stuff, right? So these are small things that seem to like, you know, but that obviously humans built these small things, but is it kind of like when somebody tries to build like a little model of something bigger that they've seen? Are there any of these larger particle accelerators that really have an effect on the way we experience reality that you believe have been built by humans in this current time, or that's completely a bullshit story? Yes, uh, I've, I can definitely say man has built some, and you, these will work at any scale. You know, you can scale these up or down, which is right. what Walter, you know, like Walter Russell Mortar, 
that would scale up or down either way. You know, he built that moat to run a 50-room university. Right. And it's six foot in floor space. But you, you know, you half that. You get less rooms, but you know, who's who's got who's got 26 bedrooms anyway? I haven't. <laughs> so you don't, right. you know, so it's showing you this technology can be worked at any scale. Now, the accelerator technology, um, what it's more involved in with, you know, it's working with elements. It can create matter, you know, it can compress right. elements into matter, is what it's really doing. So yes, man is uh, definitely using this. You know, if you want to grow your own, create your own gold, silver, copper, whatever you want to create, this technology is there doing it. It's, it's always done it. You know, this is where it all comes from. This technology. Um, you like, like again, you can go back to scriptures: mountains of gold, silver, and copper. Well, where is it coming from? Go back to Walter Russell's work that we're decoding, and look at the spiral and how it generates all these elements in the atmosphere, depending what level it's at and what octave it's at in the spiral. So all everything, all our sciences come into this. Okay. So, you know, so which includes your medicine. You know, your medicines are there. Everything's there. Right. It's all these elements are made by this construct. And this, you know, you'll find them all in nature everywhere as well. And that's why, because these things are literally everywhere around, well, below us and everywhere. So, you know, they're always, it's always creating matter is, is the point. Okay. So the, like some of the, so obviously the, there's been, people are aware of sort of the blueprint for this technology. And then there's these bigger ones that seem to have been here since the beginning of what we call anyway, recorded time, because someone or something created like the mainframe or the main one, and then smaller versions of that to support that. And then over time, other people, just like Walter Russell did at some point, either through information being shared with them or some spiritual or metaphysical inside of their own, like understood what the makeup of this was and began constructing models or smaller versions. And some of them have been put to use in a variety of applications, all of them to create things, elements, uh, particles, chemical things that are germane to the way we see our reality as being put together and, and having an effect on how we live, how we feel, our environment, all of that. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, yes. They play a very big part in the everyday life of every species, more than people realize. You know, it, it was, you know, that was a surprise for me when I started realizing how this works, how much it relates to, you know, the, your body and your environment around you. You know, going back to what you were saying about spirituality previously, uh, you know, I can look at what they're saying is spirituality, and I can decode that as some of that information is actually talking about how the construct works. Mm -hmm. It's not all, you know, spirituality is not all about people. It's not a religion. It's not all about people. It's defining this, defining how this technology works and how it plays a part with you. You know, it, it does seem more, well, it's, it's an in-between the technology and the human species kind of place to be, putting this, you know, this word spirituality is where you're at. You're trying to understand it, what it relates to. And it's the electrical part of the process of electromagnetism. That's the big secret. This is electromagnetism on a grand scale. So the, you know, the spirit world is the electrical part of this electromagnetism process. That, that exists in every living being in this world. You know, we are part of this. If it wasn't for this technology, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't exist because it creates all the, the oxygen, everything around us. It's created by this technology. We would not exist without it. So the creator created this. And, you know, I don't know how we were created. You know, were we in a lab? Were we, did we just suddenly appear? I don't know. You know, I think the answers to these questions come under full exploration. We need to be going east, west, north, south to where these gates, scripturally mentioned gates are. And I think that's where you would access this underworld and all the answers you ever needed would be there, which, you know, as you know, from our mapper model, it's going beyond the international date lines, which we've proven to be fake. They're hiding where the luminaries come from and go to, and then anything else beyond in those directions. That's what they're designed to do. This is what World War II was about, taking control of the perimeters, north, south, east and west, now under their control, so and it, controlled by their shipping and air. So is it kind of like the perimeters that we're allowed to see, like the lines we're allowed to see between, are like the stage in a theater, and when the actors, when it's time for their part in the play, they come out and they do their thing. And then when their part is over, they disappear backstage 
and you don't know where they've gone. You don't know if they're still in the theater. You don't know if they're in a dressing room. You don't know where they are uh, because they've left the perimeter of your allowed perceived reality. Yeah, you know, they could go outside the known world map. Okay. To somewhere that most of the world doesn't realize exists yet, but we can see it does. You know, these luminaries are coming from somewhere and going to somewhere, so they do exist. And they, you know, they, they mentioned in every culture's belief system. Your man, you know, your, your mandalas around the world. These are these are blueprints to this construct. And if you put the map, our map, on that mandala in the center, you will see there's a lot going north, south, east, and west that you're not even aware of yet. But we can see they exist, you know, going beyond the date lines and the north and south treaties that you, you're not allowed to go out to the Antarctic or, or Arctic. So we're boxed in basically by the by these policies that they've done since World War Two. So you don't know there's a beyond anymore. So that's how you hide it from people. Okay, so I want, there's a couple, there's so many things that I'm not trying to decide where's the best direction to go from here. But like, the, I guess the way that I began, I think why I started to be able to use your work as a frame, like, I don't know how to, like a framework device almost for understanding like my own work and, and my own experiences. I think this is why it's resonated so well for me, but also why I've been able to incorporate it in my work in a way that is helping people to understand, like whether they like my story or believe my story or not is kind of irrelevant. Like I'm trying to show them how they can take the same things you've taught and go out and see if it makes sense to their life experiences, right? Oh yeah, I mean, you're very good at words in it, Emily. You know, we listen, I do listen to your videos. You're very good at putting it across. You understand what we're saying, which so, is probably, you know, that bit is hard for a lot of people to take on board and do, I know that. So you think, know, we've met lots of people that try to explain it, but don't they don't quite grasp it themselves yet. But whereas you do, you know, you're getting the bits you understand and, and going with it and expanding on it now. So I think the reason that I've been able to do that is just because of like this odd scenario that my my life presented to me as far as myself and trying to understand it. And you know, that is that I grew up in Chatsworth, California, which is a suburb of Los Angeles that very few people have ever heard of unless they research the Charles Manson family and the mm -hmm. activities around that, um, or unless they happen to be, um, or, or unless they're hearing about like fires and earthquakes, right? Because um, the earthquakes that occur in Los Angeles are often centered around either Chatsworth or Northridge. Northridge is the next little subdivision over from Chatsworth. And then, you know, Chatsworth is an area where there's quite high winds at times and, and brush and therefore fire. So like a few years ago, there was the Woolsey Canyon fire that got a lot of attention. Um, and it was part of the fires that took place all over Southern California, out to Malibu and whatnot that seemed to be also some weird way correlated to the shooting in Thousand Oaks. And it was very bizarre, right? But these are, these are the only times people really hear about Chatsworth. And um, when I was a kid, I went to a summer camp um, that was kind of an unusual summer camp. It was in the hills of Chatsworth. And the other thing that is in the hills in Chatsworth was uh, Rockadyne and now Boeing, right? And they have this huge installation inside the mountain. There is not buildings there. There is not a manufacturing plant, right? There is these roads that you're only allowed to go so far on. Then you end up at a gate. And there are parking places on top of a mountain and paths that lead down, lead down basically into the ground at this point, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I had a lot of strange experiences as a kid that I've been trying to come to terms with, you know, in my adult life. Um, not all of them negative, but some of them so bizarre that, you know, it's almost impossible to understand. And then you come across you know, obviously, like I came across information about, you know, MKUltra and mind control programs, and I begin to look at things and they start to line up. And then you begin to understand, you know, this thing that they call the secret space program. And part of you is like, okay, God, a lot of this sounds like bullshit, but like, why does some of the stuff they're talking about have this familiarity to me, right? And the truth of the matter is, is that I grew up in an area that is incredibly important to the quote, aerospace industry, unquote, right? And um, the more I've researched, the more I don't believe anything that they say about space. And at a certain point in my own uncovering of my experiences, 
and my own research, I made the statement that um, the secret space program exists under the ground in Chatsworth. And I was saying it sort of as like a metaphor, or kind of not a joke, but like I was being somewhat ridiculous with it, right? And then I also said that the secret about secret space program is that there's no space, it's just a program, right? And I began to really look at the idea that space to the extent that it existed, exists under the ground, right? And not um, out there millions and millions and millions of miles away. Um, and so I began to, to look into my past with that idea in mind. And it led me to this idea that the underground bases in which these projects and programs are conducted, right, are under the ground. And they're, the things that we think of as exploring outer space are really exploring the depths of the inner earth. And that wherever there are any of these installations, there seems to be things that at that point, and this was long before I understood your work, there were e either particle accelerators or technologies that were related to free energy or plasma energy or cold fusion or you know, electromagnetic things, uh, techn like technologies that we're told are bullshit or don't exist or can never be practical or real or whatever. And that it really, all the- uh our technology, our technologies that don't make sense in this, in, the, in the, with the human science is what you're noticing, right. isn't it? It's not our science. Yeah. So I started to understand things that way, and I just started to like build a narrative, not because I was saying it was true, like that. What my point was, like I'm trying to understand what happened, and when I don't have like a fact I can insert somewhere, I'm kind of like being creative with my imagination to bridge the gap to the next point that I understand. And it started to get me to this place where like, you know, I had a pretty good story going on, right? And then you guys come along in my awareness um, and it seems to sort of match some of that. Can you talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on space as it's presented to us and what these companies that say they're exploring space, whether that be Rocketdyne, Boeing or these new breed of like SpaceX, Blue Origin, like, what where what are you what, what what's really going on there? Right, SpaceX and all those lot. Wow, <laughs> right, space as they present it. You know, they're trying to tell us there's a vacuum and and outer space and rocks floating around and all that stuff. Well, that's not what the, that's not the case. Those lights in the sky are actually part of the construct. They're part of the mechanisms that make it work, which is what you'll kind of find in holy books. You know the especially going further back to books like Enoch, which they didn't canonize. So you can see certain books now they didn't canonize because it strays away from the narrative they're trying to control. Because mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the descriptions Enoch gives about where the gates are and how you know, these luminaries come in, it's, it doesn't work unless you start factoring in technology. So what you know, the space industry is designed to hire as an excuse for lights in the sky, including the ISS and any other light that pretends theirs, because they're not. They're part of the construct. The ISS in our model is actually the the sun in a standby state returning east. It behaves like a sweep back transformer and fly back killer. What that means is the sun is pushed west. It's shut down or it's light suppressed and it's returned east as fast as possible to start again. This is basically how a cathode ray tube works. So it's using the sky as like a screen using this technology. So it's projecting into the sky and it's going across the sky. Now I use the word projection lightly because this is electromagnetism and, and that will penetrate everything. So it's not like, you know, people say a hologram. No, the hologram will not penetrate a building. This technology will, it penetrates everything because that's the nature of electromagnetism. So it can easily put things across the sky, we turn them back, just exactly the same as, you, as a computer screen can do, which is where the design probably came from. Your sweep back trans transform and your fly back killer, I think, is modelled from how the sun works. And that's what Jimbo, you know, Jimbo, one of our team members, that's how he worked out. You know, I got Jimbo to look at it. One, once I realised what, what the sun was doing, looking at the Nazca lines, I showed him an animation I made of it going across returning back to east and then he because because he's a black box engineer jimbo so he knows you know he's electric he knows electrical circuitry and i was trying to get him to recognize or give me the terminology what this process was doing and once i showed him it he recognized it as a sweep back transformer and fly back killer 
straight away, instantly, he got it. That's what you know. That's when that's when he realised we were on the over the target. He, you know, once we he, he realised he's looking at a technological process that he recognises himself in work he's done himself. So, so that's you know, so that's more proof for us of, of, of and better ways of you know wording what's taking place in the sky. These luminaries are just going east to west and shutting down, and starting again, basically, and repeating cycles. And if you look at our one hundred forty-four thousand video. The stars are actually going west to east, but they're going that fast to give us that wagon wheel effect, and it makes them look like they're going east to west. Now, I say this because in Hoppy Prophecy, they say the stars reverse rotation. That would make sense if this field slowed down, and then you would actually see they're going west to east, not east to west, which is what I found doing the animation for these. So, you know, your northern star trails and your southern star trails are part of the same mechanism rotating east to west. Well, we perceive it as an east to west rotation. So actually west to east, but because it's doing it that fast, you know what the wagon wheel effect is where you, you drive past a car and it looks like its wheels going the, the wrong direction. It slowly revolves the other way. That's kind of the effect they're giving us in the skies. So, you know, it's, anything they put out is an excuse for what's above. And like you said, all the actions taking place below. Everyone's looking up, they're watching cartoons on TV and believing everything they've been told while all the actions taking place below. These installations, these seals, the seal of the 144,000 are being broken into and reverse engineered, stolen, you name it, all the rest of it. That's what we're really looking at. These people are plundering the creator's glory on a grand scale, on a world scale. Because once they've stole it, once this reset happens, it's so easy for them to rewrite history, which is why I think they went digital. Digital, you can switch it off. All that history is gone. You might find some coins on the ground with rusty dates on them in the future, but this era in, I don't know, 50, years might not even exist. It'll be called the dark ages in our history, like the previous dark ages we've had, which is these resets. These people take advantage of these resets, and it gives them a big opportunity to rewrite history, reset calendars, books, you name it. And that's what's really been taking place. We can see it now. This is what's been happening for quite some time. We've been led down the garden path. Okay, so when you say, when they break into the seals of the 144,000, does that mean like they break into an inner sort of chamber? They, they, they somehow... Sarcoph yeah, sarcophagi below, yeah, a room below. So they're down below exploring all these rooms, trying to find them, break into them, okay. using using technology like, you know, like the 40s to the 90s, nuclear bomb tests. No, right. going to look at the animation I put on one of my videos, and you'll see where I've, I've actually overlaid the grid. So you can see where the bombs were going off in relation to this grid. Now, they weren't nuclear, nuclear bombs, nonsense. There was masses of TNT that they used to, you know, fake a, what they call a nuclear bomb, because they were obviously... They've got a lot of rubble to blow up to get to these places. That's why they're sealed. You know, this is called the seal. Remember, they're all sealed rooms. And you can see why. You look at book, um, well, you look at the, the Emerald Tablets. It tells you in there, man's always trying to bring it to the surface. Well, ask yourself, what is he trying to bring to the surface? What's below us that man's trying to bring to the surface? It's this technology. Okay. So, so when we see what we call underground bases or domes, these are installations that are being built out in an area where they suspect or know that there may be some of these sarcophagi, which are rooms or offices that are sealed within the ground that are pertinent to sort of the operation or, uh, or the um, how the particle accelerators work. Do I understand that correct? Yes, yes. It's the, you know, they're breaking into rooms that are part of the control mechanism for making our world work, basically. Okay, and so these, all right, so that, that fits perfectly with what I've kind of said about what's going on in Chatsworth, because the story that's publicly told is it's a, it's a um, nuclear reactor test site where they also build rockets, right? That's been like the story for a long time. I've lived, I lived in Chatsworth for most of my life. I did never see a rocket take off from there. Right. But there's been lots of stories about leaking radiation and all of this kind of stuff. And you can see the old they call the stands where they would supposedly do this stuff from. Um, but but and there's the big but like 
what I have, my suspicion as to what goes on there is they're, you know, desperately trying to uh, penetrate these inner access points to whatever this machine is to study it, to understand how it works, maybe to try and take control of it so they can control when the, the reset or the activations or whatever are. And they need to have uh, people working on it, but they can't allow p- p- people or at least not that many people to know. So everything's compartmentalized. And then you also need people like y- there's a lot of energy around these installations, right? So it's important oh, yeah. that you have a group of people that let's say have maybe a unique uh, genetic makeup that are able to withstand the energy fields that are being generated by some of these parts of the machine at times when they're either activated naturally or when you're doing an experiment to try to get something to happen. Hence, the reason why you would have the base be some near, let's say, near a summer camp where there's lots of kids that you can kind of have access to to kind of see which ones demonstrate a certain kind of energy level or kinesthetic awareness or a certain kind of, uh, you know, intelligence to be able to describe something um, that is, you know, that, that, they're, that you're going to show to them, right? Um, I have these bizarre memories from a kid, being a kid taken away from the rest of the group, right? In, in the camp, right? Or maybe with just one or two other children. And mind you, there was, when I went back and looked at the summer camp a few years ago, I hadn't remembered this. There's a very small train track that leads from the summer camp to the actual entrance to Boeing and Rockadyne, which is about like, if you went in a straight line, maybe about a mile away, right? Um, and, you know, there's even this weird thing. It's like, if you tell, if a kid is being taken for training, but all they remember is the train, they'll never be able to explain what happened to their parents, whether they can actually remember it or not, right? A little kid, um, you know, and I had all of these anomalous experiences and losses of time and very strange memories, flashback kinds of memories of, of just weird stuff, right? Not going to space, right? But there's another gentleman who grew up in the same neighborhood I grew up in. We went to the same school. He's about 10 or 15 years older than me. You've probably heard of him. His name is Andrew Bashago, and he believes he's been to Mars, right? He believes that he went to Mars when he was a kid. Um, and uh, like, I'm like, but all of the experiences he remembers having around Chatsworth as a kid, some of the places he's been, some of the things he's been involved with and whatever, they're exactly the same as mine, but he thinks he's been to space. And I think I was part of a mind control or some other kind of experimental program where, you know, there was seemingly acts like exposure to, um, a lot of sound and light technology, sound and light and energy, Right. But under no, I, no, under no impression that I have been to another planet, right? And, no. <laughs> um, right? And his, you know, he, he sees it as, oh, this is an aerospace. My, parent, my family and the people I knew were all working in the space industry. So if there was a project, it was obviously about going to space, right? Without maybe a clear understanding of where we might be talking about when we're, we're talking about space. So like I started to, you know, really integrate these things. And then I found your material and I'm like, what you're saying it fits right like it, it doesn't like my theory does not and your explanation of the inner workings of the the machine and the realm that we live in these things correspond and yeah. then i found something that i had never been able to find um and because i didn't know what i was looking for and suddenly like one day i just asked the question differently into the the googleator and maybe it was because of you guys use really particular language in your work that wouldn't necessarily be the language language that I would first guess to use, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm imagining that you've come over time to recognize that how you ask the question determines the response you get from the system, right? Yeah. Live in this computer. Um, and so I started asking the question a little differently and suddenly I, something was revealed to me that I couldn't find before. And I'm just gonna show you this so the area of Chatsworth that I grew up with, grew up in, in native, in ancient time or pre- previous times, there was a lot of uh, Indians there, a lot of Native Americans, and it was referred to as Borough Flats. And there, are you, can, see, can you see my screen? 
I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these cave paintings here, so I'm just gonna read this little part for people, right? The, um, the pictographs at Borough Flats are a remarkable record of prehistoric Native American art dating from at least 1200 to 1800 AD, probably much earlier. Based on the style of the pictographs and the multiple layers, the site could plausibly be three to 4,000 years old. The newest layer of paintings are only a few hundred years old. Okay, then it comes down here, like I'm just gonna read like this little bit, uh, there's eh, a little bit just so people who are just listening can hear it. Um, this site also has a late period component based on the presence of Spanish trade beats. The site's 1976 inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places reflects its significance. Dr. Edwin Krupp is an astronomer and has been the director of the Los Angeles Griffith, Griffith Observatory since 1974. He is recognized internationally as an expert on ancient prehistoric and traditional astronomy and has visited nearly 1800 ancient and prehistoric sites throughout the world. His 1983 book, Echoes of the Ancient Skies, The Astronomy of Lost Civilizations, he wrote an astronomical element in the paintings at Borough Flats was first noticed in early 1979 by John Romani, a graduate student in archaeology at California State University, Northridge. He thought a natural cut, a kind of bottomless, uh, bottomless window in the overhang above the western end of the panel paintings looked like it might let sun pass through and strike a part of the otherwise shaded panel at about the time of the winter solstice. Also, from the, book, from the 1983 book, the paintings which record the involvement of the Chumash with the sky are on the same plateau where the stands on which the huge moon rocket and space shuttle engines were test fired. In 2014, in a 2014 letter to NASA, Dr. Krupp noticed, noted that the NASA test stands and the Borough Flats painted shelter comprise the only place on Earth where our modern world heritage and space converges with the prehistoric reach for the sky. And for that reason, the place is irreplaceably significant in the history of space exploration, the history of NASA, yes. the history of California and America, and the history of the world. Well, what's funny about that is I don't know anybody, unless they've heard about it from me, who's heard of Chatsworth before right? People who, who research all of this kind of stuff. And yeah. um, when I look at these paintings, what I see is a particle accelerator right here on the right side, right? Yeah. You know, what, um, what he's explained there is only a fraction of what you're looking at. You know, he's, he's explained the gap in the, in the cave that lets lighting that, that'll do something on that Grid there, uh, the solstices and equinoxes, which probably does. You know, they weren't dummies. The the ancients, they were very clever people. But the, every one of those images on that wall will come with a story. You know, it's not just an image; it's a glyph. It's it's it should I each one should have a representation in words of what it's telling you. So there should be a whole story, a whole book on right. all those all those glyphs there and what they're doing. But like you said, you know, you can recognize start pulling out technological processes and aspects of things in there alone. Right. You know, like like those circles, you know, that, that represent our grid when you look at those circles, those right. concentric circles there. That um one on the right, the large bird looking one with its feathers open, you know, that that to me actually looks like the ISS. Uh-huh. So, right. you know, and, the, you know, the guy who, whoever wrote the book is correct. It is, is relating to astronomical processes, but on the scale, he's probably not comprehended yet. Right. Because, because he's only recognizing a bit of sun shining on, on through that gap. He's not actually talking about the glyphs themselves. Correct. But no one, but no one can, Emily, because I realized five years ago, everyone in the world is guessing. When I decoded what the Nazca lines were, there's on my neck stood up because I realized the implications of what I was looking at. I thought, wow, you know, I've just decoded what this, the construct, I'm decoding the construct here, and people hadn't noticed it before. When I started overlaying on the map, and it was making more and more sense. And it's, you know, our work's never stopped since them days, and that was five years ago. So we've always been on the right path, and it's like I said, these all need whole books written on them, you know, on what it's actually telling you. you know, I would like to know the what the locals tell that story to be, because that is a story there in them glyphs. There's a whole story there to decode. I can't decode it, but I know it is related to what we're working with. I know all of it is. doesn't yeah. matter where in the world, you know, doesn't matter where in the world we look at it now. They all knew how it worked and understood it. That's why a lot of these depictions look weird, and some people factor in, oh, aliens, which, of course, comes with the globe nonsense. You know, you've got a globe, you've got outer space, possibility of aliens. But all that goes away. And... 
puts all these glyphs back into the proper context. The, the, you know, the context, uh, context, they're showing you how it works. They hold you. It doesn't matter how far back you go. You find one little spiral. That tells me that culture in you, that spiral was created by an angel or a particle accelerator, wherever, however you want to word them. Because that's what they do. They create the spirals. That flow going around that hero creates a spiral in the sky. So, that's its that's its Taurus field. Okay, so 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 when I when I saw that painting, I'm like, that's a particle accelerator. Those concentric circles are the grids or the energy fields or the spirals or the vortexes created by by the angel, right? Like that was all very clear to me. And that cave paintings were there. They say the latest layer was a few hundred years ago, right? But the oldest ones are maybe three or four thousand years ago. I'm pretty sure that like Rockadine, Boeing, all that kind of stuff, that they weren't there then, right? So if there, how could there be a drawing of the particle accelerators there before Boeing and Rockadine got there if they're claiming that whatever's in the ground there is their equipment that they built? Uh, right? it's, every, it's everywhere, isn't it? it you does. know, it's, it becomes very obvious. You know, once you've debunked globe and space, it becomes very obvious what's going on, doesn't it? Because now you're the world is something far more special all of a sudden, and these people are hiding that. So, and, you, and, you, and you can see the reason why. And then you also look at it, and this is where, like, I think, you know, this is not, like I said, this is, I, I, I completely understand that child trafficking and all of this kind of stuff is an issue and a problem. But I think it's also been used to really distract us from things and make us look in places where it's not for what it is and blah, blah, blah. When you look at these concentric circles, Right. We've all come to understand that concentric circles and concentric triangles, we've been told that that's always a sign of the, you know, things related to the Eats a Gate pay and all that kind of stuff. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's what people think it is. But you try it. Yeah. They're trying to desecrate it so you don't look any further. You'll find that. Correct. They try and, they try and desecrate anything sacred so you never go there, you know. Yeah, that's that's what I've noticed they do. Well, you, um, also, you also will find if you, when there's paintings on the wall like this, right? Like, yeah. you ever, did you ever watch the TV series Twin Peaks? Uh, that sounds familiar. OK, so <laughs> you, you should watch it for a lot of reasons, because I think it validates your work in, in a way that like you have to sit with it for a second. But you can line it just like I've lined up my story on top of it. You can line up the story of tw the Twin Peaks story on top of it. Right. And yeah. basically it's explaining sort of the connection between secret societies and then Oh yeah, yeah. And you start to see them, don't you? You start to see them break down the connections and they all, you know, they all portray it in movies, it's in songs, dances, jewelry, money, it's everywhere. You can't stop seeing it once you see it. And so, you start seeing all the connections and how these people flaunt it like they own it. So in in Twin Peaks, where you start to understand the connection between secret societies and what they call like UFOs or alien stuff or whatever, right? Where those two realities come together are in areas where there are cave paintings, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, so think about this. And, and then we say that the secret societies are the ones who are conducting these programs, doing these awful things to children. And I'm not even saying they're not, right? But my question is, is like, what's really going on with some of these children or people why are they considering some people to be special and we need them for our ceremony or our ritual or this or that and my suspicion is that some of these kids either a have a resonance or an energy or a vibration that makes them uh, eligible to go near one of these machines right and something like they're in resonance with it in some way or they have been in a project or a program that exposed them to that, and they now carry that energy field with them, which is something that allows for certain things to happen then wherever they go, right? Or, or they're a family member that already knows, and they're just playing their part. Right? So, you know, so we see these symbols that have been, like, so now we see, okay, when they, we see the concentric circles, the concentric triangles, that's the sign for, for child trafficking, but... At a deeper level, aside from just the gross, obviously human base level of child trafficking, what else is going on? Does somebody well, understand? well, on the on the child trafficking, let me say now, now we know what they're doing at the international date lines. We've noticed a lot of excuses are, you know, people say, but I've been to Hawaii and there's lots of Japanese people live there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Does that prove you live on a spinning ball? No, it does not. How did them people get there? Because if you want to 
if you, you know, this is one where you might be able to trace some of these children. If you go to some of the places on, on you know, as far east as you can go, as far west as you can go, and you've seen people there from another place, you know, like this and they've seen Japanese people in Hawaii, go and ask them people how long, how long have they lived there? Did they go there voluntary or did they just end up there? Mm-hmm. How did they get to these lands? Mm-hmm. Did they, you know, were they taken as a child, put into a care home there and then released to the community and people now assume, oh, Japan's just over that direction because Japanese people live here. So that, you know, that could explain where people in the East go missing and end up in the West and vice versa. Yeah. So anyone in the West might turn up in the East to reinforce this bullshit that, you know, on the other side of the globe when you're not, <laughs> you know, you're on the other side of the map, but you're not, in, you know, you can't go East to get West in but the real world. It's also like, to, to the point you just said, which I think is interesting, and, and my point with the child trafficking is what is, what do we know exactly what the purpose or how many purposes there are, right? Like if a kid has a certain vibration or a certain resonance or energy field, and that is necessary in some place to get to some place so something can happen, then the idea that it's about this base human gross concept is a good cover story for why you need to move people around from place to place so that you can do your rituals or have them there because their energy is needed for some kind of thing. And to your point, like maybe for whatever they were trying to make happen in the progression of the course of the world, having a certain type of people, say Japanese people over here would allow something to occur that couldn't occur if that happened. So that migration was encouraged, just like the migration of like, you know, Somalians to certain areas or people from Latin America into other areas or whatnot. Like why are certain, like, obviously we understand like the basic political or George Soros explanation for things, but sometimes I think that's either a cover or a secondary convenience for a deeper thing. You're trying to create a specific kind of energy for something to happen. And these people have that in their genes to sort of manifest that. Does that, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't looked too much into humans and all that kind of things <laughs> you guys look at. You know, we're, we're that busy with what we're doing. I, I can see what you're doing. You know, we do look in sometimes and watch some of your videos. But, you know, I haven't had the experience or, you know, can you, can you, yeah, I can't prove some of those things. You know, you can, you can speculate forever on some right. things, but, you know, you're going to, you, you know, you're not going to go any further with it. So, you know, there's no harm in talking about it. Like, you know, we're just there with the international datelines and missing children. I'm just offering information that might find where they actually are and how they ended up there. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know, uh, you know, going back to, you know, this, this symbology that they use, it's, you know, this, they've stole it and desecrated it. And this, you know, people call this satanic and you look into satanic things and it's the same again, it's all the world's sacred geometry of how this world works is what it's trying to tell you. And they're trying to scare you off by, you know, like I said, desecrating it by or associating it with things that would put you off looking at it this is how they operate it's all right for them to do to you know to portray it and display it but not you they don't want you to know what it relates to but we know what it relates to it's all it's all to do with the mechanics of this realm so you should be looking into all that do not fear the creator's glory because this is what all this sacred geometry represents doesn't matter what culture is displaying it it all represents the same thing so it would not be wrong for a Christian to look into the Islamic world and marvel at their technology, well, their, their um, sacred geometry. It's just a different. It's just a different depiction of the same thing. Isn't they all knew, you know, they all knew how it worked. Isn't it funny how we've been told, or I haven't because I wasn't religious, but I know lots of people who are of one religion or one belief who were told looking into another one is of the devil, looking into sacred geometry is of the devil, moving your body in this way is of the devil, of the devil, of the devil, right? And and it keeps them from even understanding the thing that they say that they believe, right? Yeah. Well, once you start decoding it, Emily, you know, you can reassure people, well, no, it doesn't mean that at all. You know, he, you can actually give them better information you know like the devil you know as far as i'm concerned now the devil is the milky way the devil is is depicted often as a dragon isn't it right a dragon is a milky way which is a spiral it's spiraling generating alternating currents i decoded that in our 144,000 video it's actually a spiral coming east going east to west and that's what creates the day and night cycle it activates and deactivates things around the world and approved it using the solar panel because come a certain time of day AC, well, daytime would be 
um, positive and nighttime would be negative. So it kind of flips. It changes the polarities between day and night. And I detected it on a solar panel because it made the solar panel operate in reverse. Instead of being a water pump, it now, instead of pumping air into a water, into a bucket of water, you know, bubbler, I made a a solar-powered bubbler, which bubbles water into uh, air, air into water during the day, but at night time it reverses its switch polarities and try to soak uh, suck the water back up the tube towards the solar panel, wow. well towards the actual pump. So there's a definite switch takes place at night, which is what I'm working on now. Uh, it's going to be in the next video, wow. but you know. So so what we're proving there is you know th- this is the mechanics of the world and how it works. So, you know, I don't know if your viewers have watched that video, but, you know, the 144,000 video, it's a must watch. But it goes so much, you know, your rainbows and information in there, it's in there as well. And the, the pyramids, what they actually are, how they work, where Walter's motor design actually comes from. This information's in that video. And so it's a very important video people need to watch. It'll take you into the, really into the deep end <laughs> for explanations on how it works. I'll make sure to link that in the description of this so people can go and check that out, you know, hit pause and go check that out for a bit and then kind of come back. Um, one I'll comment- put it, uh, what I'll do, um, Lee, I'll put it on the screen, actually. Well, we'll you know, we'll just leave it play on the screen while we talk anyway, we can't. Okay, cool. That sounds um, good. Where's it at? I did have it on the screen, but now I can't I see One it. Conscience has joined us. One Yay. Conscience. Welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Emily. Thank you. Hi. Coming. Hello, Juan. Nice to meet you too, Emily. So we've been kind of just having a chat about, he's been telling, you know, telling the listeners about, you know, your guys' research, how you got, how you've moved from sort of place to place with it and how you've gotten to where you are. And I've been kind of going through with him a little bit of how I have um, applied my understanding of your work to experiences I've had to make it meaningful to me, to help me to better like explain it and to people and you know because it's 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 a lot of stuff to go through and not everybody is inclined to that many hours of listening or research but if you can find a way to sort of personalize some of the information and share it in story form to people it it really grabs their interest so we've been kind of going through some of that and um now you're here with us and you you know you sort of bring a really unique voice to the the complete work that you guys do so um it's the first time i've met you why don't you just tell my listeners a little bit sort of uh, about how you got how you joined the team here and got into this research and what your contribution is um okay so well i met fpv first um when he did his first live stream with cat's eyes and i popped into the stream and it just grabbed me by my by my soul. That's the only way I can really describe it because I just felt all the way through me that this was fact and that I had to be a part of this. And I asked him probably about a thousand questions in the chat. And then we just started talking on Hangouts and i told him that i was studying earthquakes so he found that intriguing and plotting them to to show the movement of this stuff in the underworld Um, so that's kind of where i started since then we have grown so much (laughs) um so we like you were saying personalizing it so we try to research all kinds of different subjects because for each person there's going to be that one thing that grabs their attention Mm -hmm. and once it does grab their attention they are going to want to delve deeper into the whys the causes which is what we try to give everyone the causes of any of these effects that we see um So what I do is I try to go through science and facts that mainstream give us and basically tear them apart and put the APM take on them and decode them into what uh, our electromagnetic realm is offering. That's my main. Yeah, um, I think that was the early like you know so the response you had the first time you saw the work was pretty much the same thing that I had right like I watched yeah and I'm like wow I'm seeing 
graphics and just like, you know, sort of the, the, the images that were being shown were things that have been part of like my own personal inner third eye vision in the world for a long time, right? And like, I, I didn't know other than possibly my, uh, my high, the, the two, the two options for me were my highest self, like this part of myself that exists outside of time and understands all of this stuff, or like a really high tech, you know, mind control program that is like beaming visions into my, my head, right? <laughs> like I didn't know which one it was, <laughs> but they were very particular and they did have a very holistic organic feel to them. So I was always um, kind of in love with them, whether, I, right? Like I, I didn't, I, 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 you know, I always leaned more towards like, this is something myself is trying to tell myself about, right? And making it beautiful to do so. Um, and when I saw the first video I ever watched, I saw some things that I'd only ever seen behind my eyelids before, right? So it grabbed me in that same way that you described. And then I think in one of the, um, one of the first videos that I watched, you were talking some about earthquakes and I, I feel like, and I could be confusing it with a conversation I had with someone about that afterwards or whether it was something you said, like you kind of were referencing or there was some reference to like some of the work that, that Dutch since had done on earthquakes and sort of like where it was good to a point and where it sort of stopped and, and, and why it couldn't be gone any farther with and, and whatnot. And, and I started listening to you and the way you sort of, understood it and the way you had to like overcome the fact that like even people who had informed your journey could only go so far and if you were going to go any farther you had to go on your own um and i remember just that that was always in my mind right as i listened to you that that that, that first story i really heard you tell yeah because <clears throat> dutch dutch is really uh brilliant he is he he figured out how to predict earthquakes but that's the key factor is these things are predictable and they will happen in the same spots over and over and over repeatedly <clears throat> so that right there is a big eye catcher but his you know he has some flaws because he follows a globe model so mm -hmm. there's things that he tries to predict that never occur they don't mm -hmm. come to about because of the globe model and what he's saying would come from say japan into america right so you know even back when they had that big tsunami and their huge earthquake according to a globe model that energy should have came over and hit america next right. but it didn't because that's on the east side and we're on the west right and that's where his his basically his only flaw you know, right. recently he said that there was a couple things he didn't understand. And I even made a video trying to explain more and, and invited him for a chat. But, you know, he is who he is and he does what he does. And he obviously didn't have any interest in that. So, yeah, and it made perfect sense to me the first time I heard you saying it. Like the only times his predictions are wrong, they wouldn't be wrong if he just flattened the map out because what he thought was going to occur here actually occurred over there where he thinks it's not, but it actually is. And I was like, oh, okay, that perfect sense. Like, yeah, exactly. He's wrong. He's not actually wrong. He just is like, got the location wrong because he's working with the wrong map. And so it was like, wow, that is, uh, it's so, but it, it's interesting how sometimes our beliefs keep us in our own way. Right, like we're more brilliant than we know, but the but our belief is is, is the enemy of our knowing, right? So. Yeah, yeah, and like he he keeps looking at this thing on the California coast called a slow slip, where he's predicting that eventually there's going to be this big earthquake, but he can't pinpoint like when. Well, if he would understand like APM that all of this is running on cycles, and what has occurred in the past will occur again. He may have a better understanding and start to look back deeper to find the trend of exactly when this may happen. And, and you know, he can call it a slow slip. That's fine if that's what he's comfortable with. But it is a cycle, you know, so it's going to happen when it happens based on when it did it happen in the past. Right. You know, and that's how scientists also work with these volcanoes and and stuff like they're not admitting that earthquakes can be predicted even though dutch has proved them wrong over and over yeah but they do work like that with volcanoes because they know that certain ones are going to erupt at certain times based on history you know yeah. those big guys the big ones so they may not be able to predict it to the exact day but 
they know when and maybe they can and they're just not telling us because you know they figure that's a good way to wipe out a lot of humanity right you know i don't know i can't speak for them but they do know when it's going to happen and they may even actually know that the earthquakes are completely predictable but they're never going to admit that because that would prove that we are on a cycle system Right. A 100 percent cycle system that these things occur over and over in the exact same spots. And it's just flows. It's a flow. It just repeats. So you mentioned cycles and, and you know, we, like in the conversation I've been having with FPV so far, we haven't quite gotten there. But, you know, your work is based on this idea that there's sort of a, a, a 400 year cycle where there's then like a, re a reset or a complete, you know, shake up of the system and then things sort of begin again. Where would you guys say that that we are in that cycle right now? Like where, I mean, we're obviously in the midst of some kind of um, speeding up, some kind of event that's like really speed, you know, speeding up at an increasingly accelerating pace. Um, where in that process do you think that we are? And um, do you think that, it, that there's something, um, th that there's anything different about it this time? than there has been in the past, or are we literally just repeating history? Um, well, I don't, you know, I can't speak for FPV, but what I would say is that we are definitely beginning this new cycle. Um, and the only thing different that may affect any of it, and it could go either way, whether it makes it worse or not as bad, would be the way that, like, the fracking of the earth. Because what they what they're doing is they are making new release points in the surface so when they frack the earth it will cause say where a big quake or whatever would have hit um at the new madrid because that's really close to where i live so i kind of that one fascinates me but um now uh, it has a big release point in oklahoma so they've kind of moved it or released some more pressure before it would hit to that new Madrid point, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't even know if that'll affect what's going to happen naturally anyway, but it's, it definitely affects some of the effects that we feel, Do you, you know, think... and FPV I'm sure has his own different ideas based on what he's learned, you know? <laughs> Do yeah. you... <laughs> Uh, do you think that, like, let's say the fracking, which, right, obviously we're, we're trained by one portion of the media to think that, like, that's the worst thing in the world, and another portion to be like, oh, but it's great for the economy or for providing more gas or whatever bullshit, right? But maybe that the people who have been understanding this information for a long time and trying to manage these cycles have maybe this time feel like, well, maybe it's better we, we don't have... Um, is many people die because like the humans are actually useful to our programs and plans. They create a lot of energy, right? They are, they're useful for, now they're useful for storing information and for, you know, you can use them as batteries and this, that, and the other thing. So let's, um, let's try and relieve a little bit of pressure, but still make things painful and chaotic. So they'll survive, but they'll, they'll think that somehow we did something to help them to survive so they'll be thankful on the other side of it and they won't mind their indentured servitude because they're at least they're alive and they're better to us alive than dead right do you think that there's some of that going on or it's just pure experimentation and it's not um with any idea in mind of like having people survive or not survive it's just they're pushing the different buttons on their machines either of you can answer that well, well, if I, I, you want. yeah <laughs> I think that they want, they'll keep us around until we're not useful anymore, you know, and whether or not they even have the ability to totally wipe things out like that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they do to a point, but I think when the, the realm takes its cycle, mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to, we're going to know. And if we're not on high ground or somewhere safe, we won't survive, mm -hmm. you know? And, and man-made structures and stuff could definitely make it worse. Like dams, if you look at dams, there is always a huge dam near towns. Mm -hmm. So when those things pop, 
break. Obviously, it's going to happen if, you know, a large earthquake or or water over starts to overflow, then it's going to wipe out all these towns around. It's going to wipe out a lot of people, you know. My answer would be it's an extermination program because you're all potential witnesses and pe- uh, the world is waking up to what's really going on, like us, like what we're showing with our research. You know, um, we've had to warn every member joining our team. This comes with uh, an element of danger. He would be stupid not to think otherwise because these people aren't playing games. Right. So, you know, what we're seeing is an extermination program of potential witnesses, and especially, you know, flat earths come out six years ago. Well, it's always been out, but, you know, it, it seemed to take off again six years ago and more and more people look into it and you realise, yeah, the globe is nonsense. So, you know, we've got the world waking up to what's really going on. There's people like us all working it out. You know, witnesses that they, they don't want around. If they're going to reset history, they're going to wipe, you know, what, they're, what they're hoping for is a mass extinction event, which this realm can create by itself. They're just going to make it worse by tampering with food and water and all the rest of it, which is what, what you know they're doing. Same with the chemtrails. You know, there's probably multiple layers behind chemtrails. Right. But what we can see they're doing with the chemtrails is they're interfering with the precipitation process, so it makes the angels not function as good as they should be, which mm-hmm. kind of hides them a bit. You know, this is exactly what it's designed to do. This is why Bill Gates wants to fill the air with chalk, so it dries the atmosphere up. There's no water precipitation. The angels aren't performing as good as they should. So they're interfering with the construct, trying to hide it. Because we are going to see more and more of it get revealed. You know, the sun halo, the moon halo, the lunar waves, people's noticing. The pro- I mean, they've probably always been there. People probably just didn't check the footage and see it. Right. But, you know, other things, yeah, you know, it's going to become more and more obvious. Now, we can't put a date on it, but I'm pretty sure they've got a date from the Antikythera mechanism. I don't know if you ever looked at that, but it predict- it's, a pre- it's a predicting computer the ancients built a few thousand years ago. And, you know, it, it can actually predict all the lunar phases, planetary movement, you name it. And it's a hand crank computer, basically. You know, this is 2,000-year-old, mind. <laughs> and I would say they use this, they still use that device today because it was designed, you know, these old ancient calendars are designed to mark down these resets, like the main calendar, the one that ran out in 2012. Well, that was the main long count calendar of 394 years. So why did they stop? making it well obviously you know they got invaded they were taken over they now believe in a bible and all the original beliefs and knowledge is lost but that calendar was a countdown marker to this next reset which our generations are all going to witness you're witnessing it now go outside and see the sun halo this is it coming to life and you'll find this in hobby prophecies and all kinds so you know everyone's waking up and realizing hmm, wait a minute them their, their excuses don't work you know that's always that shape it's we can predict it we can see it and we can see they're trying to hide it you know if it was ice crystals nothing to worry about why the hell are they spraying the sky then right because eventually you get start to recognize the technology don't you you see the particle accelerator technology in the sun halo the same design so you know back to Ezekiel's wheel in a wheel again this is what the ancients were describing how this world worked they knew it was technology they just didn't know what words to give it And would this be why, like, with all of the other great nonsense that they've fed us for so long, all of the psychological operations, all of the propaganda, we've been fed the most extreme one right now because what you're speaking of has become so undeniable, so obvious that literally you can't have people go outside of their home because if they did, they would see it. Yeah, yeah, you know, your lockdowns, (laughs) you know, it's it's probably a trial run for when... You're going to see even more in the sky, which we, you know, we know that we're going to see more events unfold in the sky that defy mainstream explanation. But they work perfectly in our model because this is how it works. So, you know, that's where we're at. We, we know they're blagging it. They, they lie into the public and they mask, you know, they're trying to mask it. It's the same with this these trans agendas that people go on about. We can see how that factors into this because during this reset, this is going to interrupt our genes and everything. You know, everything gets affected by it. You've seen some of the images we've used in from the Book of Miracles. 
that Sandra read through. You know, you've mm-hmm. seen these different species with different species body parts and things on them. So these are some of the mistakes the construct can make during these times. So they want minimum birth rate. They, they, they ah. can't, you know, you know, they can't hide this, can they? So, so the only way they can hide it is promote by promoting it. They promote, you know, ah. trans trans agendas, so it looks natural and normal. But it and is also, really, ta- you know, but it is really taking place on a world scale, and you might not notice it at first. I mean, obviously, you're going to notice someone that's got the, another species arm or leg or something. That would be very obvious, wouldn't it? Right. But and it can and will happen from what we've seen in history. They're the parts that they're going to be really struggling to explain, aren't they? So, uh, and this also what you're saying about okay, they don't want as many babies born because the babies might come out with a tail. So let's give them a thing that would might sterilize them anyway to reduce the possibility of that. And the ones who aren't sterilized, they'll have chosen to become the opposite gender, which that will also lead to sterilization and blah blah blah. Right. So there's all of these sort of reasonable excuses for having there be less less children brought in during this time because they will be genetically odd. Yeah. Plus, you know, going back to the missing children again, how do we know they're not taken somewhere outside of this grid and being educated that these people put those lights in the sky from a young age? Yeah. You know, they could be our future replacements getting schooled somewhere off grid, away from all this. They come back after the... the put them, you know, inst- install them everywhere and they put their system back in and it carries on. But they're now taught in their times, man put those lights in the sky because that's where it's really heading. If you're going to steal all this, then obviously you're going to lay claim to it that it's yours and you put those lights in the sky. Yeah. Well, I mean, that... that- and everyone, everyone in our time knows that is not true, don't they? But yeah, children, yeah. brainwashed children of the future would have no option but to believe it because... You know, it's famous words from a movie. We accept the reality w- w- which we've been presented. The problem is when you scrutinize that reality and it falls apart, then what they've presented is absolute nonsense. Yeah, no, that's an interesting idea. That they've all been sort of taken off the plantation to be educated, to be brought back in later, right? We it's it's easy. Them. It's easy done when you control it all, isn't it? Well, you, we usually think of being of the slaves being on the plantation, so we wouldn't think to look like no, actually the slaves have been taken off of the plantation to be brought back in later, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, so it's like you know you've got a clone army hiding somewhere waiting to move back in that so, have been completely indoctrinated with, with totally everything that's false. So I'm, I'm gonna guess you haven't heard of maybe you have. There's a gentleman named Kalindi Iyi who passed away pretty early on in the whole COVID thing. Have you guys heard of him, Kalindi E.E.? No, I didn't sound familiar to me. All right, so he's an interesting cat. Like, he's one of these guys you could never really tell how old he was. He probably looked like he was 40, but according to my friend Sonia Barrett, because she was, you know, longtime friends with him, he was in his 70s, right? And what he was well-known for, he had a couple of things he sort of talked about and was well-known for, but the main thing was that he took incredibly high doses of psychedelic mushrooms. And when I say high doses, I mean like 10 times the amount that most people who are considered psychonauts take, right? Mm -hmm. And his reports were kind of in line with what you were just saying, right? When he would take a, a certain dosage, it would open up a realm where you suddenly started to see people who had like animal body parts or who were like some weird blend of genders or who looked like the things from back on, like you see on the ancient Egypt stuff where it's like a man with the bird head or whatever, right? It was like at this dosage, you started to see this. At this dosage, you started to see that. At that dosage, you you know, you would see this other thing, right? And he had a, a lot of interesting ideas about what was really going on. And seeing is that the particle accelerators and the activation of these sort of processes create vibration, right? That sort of, I mean, this would be um, connected to like what we think of as like other realms or other dimensions or what's happening at a certain frequency, right? Like it's possible that he was beginning to see sort of a preview of some of this stuff. I've had a few like 
more, much more minor occurrences of some of these kinds of things when I'm, you know, in a certain state where it's like, wow, like that person looks normal to me usually. But when, when I, <laughs> when I've been, at, when I, when I've eaten mushrooms and I'm at this party and there's a, by the dance, the music is like, you know, at a certain frequency, why does this person look like they have pointy ears to me all of a sudden? The person next to them doesn't, but this person does. Like there's like a reality there that is veiled at some points. Um, and my own question has always been about something like psilocybin or psychedelic mushrooms. If they're somehow like the thumb drives or like the compressed data of the machine, right? Of the various realms and, and dimensions that sort of the machine affects and that these things, obviously they, you know, they can grow naturally in the ground or people can do it sort of hydroponically, but they seem to have like a store of like, all of this kind of information that is also recorded in, in, you know, these ancient texts and on the cave paintings and the glyphs and whatnot, like inside of the experience, right? So what you were just talking about made me think of, um, of his, his recollections of some of his experiences. Yeah, you know, I've heard, uh, well, there was a guy a few a couple of years ago, going on about taking certain things and seeing certain things, but other people had to go him about it. You know, you got to be very careful with that because right. at the end of the day, it's down to that individual's interpretation of what they're seeing, isn't it? So it's not a proof of anything. Correct. But I do know, I know, I do know by my own experience, acid or LSD can enhance the the light spectrum. Yep, it does work. You know, it does enhance it. You'll see lights a lot brighter and dazzle more dazzling appearing than they normally would. You know, yeah. I've experienced that myself long time ago <laughs> yeah, no, but yeah you know but I, so i won't discount it but you know it's not something we can use as a proof because it, it does change from individual to individual so it's yeah. hard to, you know it's hard to i wouldn't use it as a, as a real world evidence but the way it enhances the light spectrum was very interesting you know oh, that sorry. that route that route there probably is worth looking into further how you know can we enhance it to see things we don't normally see because you know this spectrum is a lot more than we can see well, my, my experience was, would definitely say so. That's my absolute favorite part of the psychedelic experience is the colors I see because they mm -hmm. contain within them information that is not available in the regular light spectrum that we normally see. And this this has emotion and like an emotion attached to it. When I see a certain color tone, right? There's a feeling that goes along with it and almost like a, a way that my mind thinks that when I can't see that color anymore, doesn't happen. Right. And, and yeah. so the, the the way that the light looks, the light spectrum and then the way that the sounds sound differently, I think are definitely uh, due for some further exploration as to what they can tell us about our, our you know, the realm and, and why this is like, why do we not normally see and hear these things? And why when we do this, do we and is that information important and applicable uh, in, in other in other, in, in other times, not just in that experience, right? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we have had people come into our stream and say the grid that we're presenting, they've seen it with their own eyes in the sky, being on uh, you know certain yes. types, certain type of substances. They send we're seeing the same thing what you're showing there. No, I can't prove that. You know, if what a video you can prove it. You know, is there eye seeing it, but the camera's not seeing it? There's a lot of things. You know. How can we enhance, you know, how can we get the equipment to see it? That's that's where we're at. How can we prove what's there using equipment of, you know, the today's equipment like cameras? Do you know, we probably need special lenses and all kinds of equipment, you know, it's things that you haven't heard of before. I'm well, pretty sure these people have got it and they're looking at it, but they're not going to give that to the public. So, you know, these are routes we look down to. How can we see more than what we're actually seeing here? You know, how can we? So, present it, you know, that's what we're trying to do, you know, find different ways of showing it to people because it is there, you know, that was our research over the last five years shows it's there, it exists. So what you're saying, that has been my experience, right? Like I can look up in the sky under, you know, if, when I'm on mushrooms and you can just see way more stuff. My experience has generally been, and, and it's different depending on where you are. Like in, when I would do it in Los Angeles, you don't see much. You go out to Joshua Tree, Oh my God. It's like, you were like, well, my God, there's like, whatever the things are up there, there's thousands of them. They're everywhere. Why doesn't anyone talk about this? How come nobody can see this? But what my experience has been is if I, can, I, it becomes obvious to me when I'm in the psychedelic state, but then if there's someone around who's not, but I can point to them and describe where I'm seeing what I'm seeing and what I'm actually seeing, 
if they sort of focus on it, oh my God, then they can see it. Like their, their brain wouldn't have picked it up if it wasn't pointed out to them, right? It's somehow like easier to detect when you're in that state, but I've been able to sort of give them an explanation of what I'm looking at. And then they're able to be like, oh, kind of like when you're little and you saw figures in the clouds, right? And yeah. the other person might not see it, but then when you sort of pointed to them where it was and explained the dimensions of what you were looking at, oh, then they can see it, right? Um, but I agree with you, like, you know, that there, there has, you know, some of these places where like out near Joshua Tree is where they have some of these military bases, some of these big telescopes, and I'm sure that that's why they have them there, because it's the best place for viewing, um, and that, you know, they can see it all the time or, or, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it is difficult, but, you know, someone just has to go look at that for themselves. And if you, you know, some of the stuff, I'm not like a person who's that interested in like UFOs or anything like that, I, other than, you know, it comes up in relation to other research I do. So all of a sudden I look up and they're everywhere. It's not like my mind wants to see that, right? The things that mm -hmm. people have described as UFOs, I don't know that that is what they are, but things that seem to match what a lot of people have talked about for a long time that I mostly don't care about and don't think about are suddenly everywhere, right? It is a fascinating, um, you know, a fascinating thing to experience. Um, one, any, any thoughts on, on what we've been talking about here? Um, I mean, not so much. It just, you know, the mushrooms will enhance, you know, your vision. Yeah. Um, I've seen little little uh, little light particles all over the sky you mm -hmm. know whenever I've I've done that which was quite a few years ago but um, you know and it, it just opens different parts of your brain mm -hmm. to be more active than they normally are and you know why aren't they active well probably the stuff they're feeding us and the water and you know all this because we have way more potential than what we're allowed to have mm -hmm. you know yeah so i just i think that the mushrooms definitely they change something in your brain chemistry you know like now they're what, using them for depression and mental illness to try to cure that right you know and so it's it's changing your brain chemistry it's kind of like balancing you out it's making you um, reach more of your potential than than what we are normally allowed to to reach. Yeah, yeah, that's been my that, that's been my experience with with them uh, as well. Um, over the course of this conversation, there's like a couple of people's um, work that has popped to mind um, that were people that I've looked into over the course of my own journey for the last twenty plus years, and and I wanted to ask you about um, some of them just to get your thoughts. Um, because I, you know, like these were people who like the, when, when I first, when I came across your work, I'm like, oh, it kind of reminds me of the thing I heard about back then, but much more fleshed out and much more updated and whatever. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about them. And then I wanted to ask you about uh, a TV show that plays with the concept that, that you were talking about a little bit earlier, FPV. So the first person, obviously you guys use Walter Russell a lot in your work and, and um, you know, I think that's appropriate, obviously. Like I fortunately was, um, while I haven't done all the deep, deep research you all have done, like early in my awakening, um, I was, you know, I listened to an interview with Matt, Randy back, Randy, you know, Randy, I listened to him for many years before I was you know, on the show with him. He did an, an early interview with Matt Presti, like maybe back in like 2009 or 10. Um, and so I was always aware of that, that work and, you know, looked into a couple things over the years. So that obviously you guys uh, look into. Are you familiar with the books by Raju Cinemar? I'm not. Doesn't sound familiar to me, no. So Raju Cinemar is a Romanian author that is kind of like very sort of secretive. Um, but he also is Romanian. So a lot of the books have been sort of translated and published here in the United States by a gentleman named Peter Moon. Um, and there's one book in particular called Inside the Earth um, that is quite interesting. Um, that does, it, it doesn't say exactly what you say, but would, I think the, the two ideas could coexist, right? Like I think that's something that, you know, if the structure is, as you say, 
And then there's some of these technologies that go along with it or are overlaid or being used on top of it. I feel like it, that the structure you all describe supports the reality that Radu Sinemar describes. Um, and it's kind of an interesting book. It's not very long. It's like, I don't know, maybe 200 pages, it, but it's, it's got both a story to it and then also a lot of like physics. And it, de it even deals with some of the same ideas and places in terms of, you know, Peru and, and, and whatnot that your, that your work does. Um, and I don't think necessarily he has everything right. You know, there's a slant to everything, but there's some interesting ideas presented there. So I was just wondering if you had and if you haven't maybe to take a look and and I'd be open to hearing either yes this sort of goes along with things or like no and here's why so if that ever comes across your your plate or you have time I, I feel like there's some stuff there that, that that is kind of interesting um and then there's another person who also I was turned on to by Randy years ago and and I enjoyed his material for a while and then he became really dogmatic and just like not pleasant to listen to for me and that man is James Horak. Do you know who he is? Nope, never heard of him. <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> okay, so James, James, like, was talking about what he called EMVs, which were like electromagnetic vehicles. Like, I think he was basically saying that the things people think of as UFOs are what he calls like EMVs, and how they're sort of piloted by consciousness, and they are related to these metallic structures that are inside the earth at certain points right he did not call them particle accelerators but th what he described i suppose could could match up to some of that right and he had been there's a guy named i think Nor norman bergren or something who wrote a book about the ring makers of the that the rings of saturn or something about the ring makers of saturn and james some like knew him or had worked with him or or somehow had learned some of this stuff from this guy, right? Um, and it also dealt with like some of the same, it was basically about how these EMVs or something had created these lines or these rings in the sky or how they were controlled by it. And so when you guys talk about some of the things you do, I'm like, wow, it kind of sounds like, you know, like it, he maybe had a little different understanding or not as much of an in-depth and certainly hadn't fleshed out all of the whys and hows and the spirituality and the, the, you know, ancient stuff about it, but he was kind of talking about the same thing. And he was around a lot in like that 2008, nine to 2011, 12 period of time. And then he kind of fell off. Uh, he's like, he got a little preachy and political and just made, became unpleasant to listen to. Cause it was kind of like, if you don't agree with everything I say, then you're bad and you're wrong. And that's uh, it. I end up like that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people always do that, you know, they come to a stream or, a comment to my check such and such out. But we know we don't need to anymore because we have got the map and model working. Yeah. You know, I always say to them, well, tell them to check us out and they'll realize where their bit of jigsaw plugs in. Because, you know, if we're working yeah. with a map and model, we now need all the little pieces that plug back into it to make it all work correctly, which is yeah. where we're at now. You know, you, um, everyone will have their own little, eure you know, their, their own eureka moments and their own revelations as they look more and more into this. You know, yeah. you're obviously having some yourself looking around and realizing, oh, yeah, there's something special going on here. And it's that is, you know, it's starting to reveal itself, which it will. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, we try not to look at other people's work, really, because we know we don't need to. And it would also put your doubt on your own work if you start to look at other people's theories. We don't need to look at theories. You know, we've got the yeah. we've got the cause of the effects everyone's speaking of. So yeah. I would I would word it that way. You know, look at yeah. our work and see what it plugs in. I, I was just asking because like, not that I'm saying, oh, you should definitely go check this out. But these, like when I came across your work and then again, in this conversation, it was just remindful of like, you know, some things that I had heard before and like maybe a more um, early stage, of, right? Like the, I, I don't think they had fleshed out the ideas as much. And so I just what had been curious had, if over the years they had come up for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm not knocking the guy, you know, the guy maybe yeah. has got, he maybe has figured something out, you know, cause everyone's got little bits and pieces that probably don't make sense until you put it into the right picture. Right. And, you know, if he puts what he's talking about into, into our map and model, he's going to say, Oh yeah, that plugs into their spirit. And now it makes sense. You know, he's going to realize, yeah, yeah. I was right all along. So he's, you know, he's worked something yeah. out himself and, he obviously didn't know where to go, but you know, he's thinking he lives on a globe. What do, you know, people <laughs> right. people yeah. are going to get lost. They don't know what to do with this information, do they? 
So then the other thing, and maybe it isn't so much about the person, although I just will say his name because this is where I first heard about it or learned about it from, but this kind of idea or this science and that um, is biogeometry and Ibrahim Karim. Are you familiar with some of that? Uh, nope. <laughs> okay, so when you were talking earlier about the personification of these energies or machines or, or, or whatnot, right? Like that they've, you know, what they've done with the, the ener these particle accelerators are sort of an energy and then they've created these personified gods and whatnot, right? So mm -hmm. we were taking um, a, a, like a workshop on bio, sort of on biogeometry and he was a presenter. I I've heard him speak in, in things in the alternative media over the years. And what was interesting is he was kind of saying what you were saying in that the ancients in Egypt, right? They sort of, they, they had these, um, he was discussing the netters in particular, but explaining how we had this scenario where like people lived amongst the, na the natural elements and the natural energies. And as the brain started to develop in a certain way, and whether you can say that that was natural or an unnatural process, people started to try and apply, um, you know, what, the, the, like, uh, I always get the besides the brain confused, but like left brain, I think left brain is a lot, left brain logic to right brain content, right? So like they were trying to, they were trying to describe an energy and they couldn't do it without personifying it, right? And this guy's pretty interesting in terms of like, he's into radiesthesia and like exploring the energies behind light color spectrums and whatnot. But when you were talking about the personification of energy, um, it made me think of like what I had learned from him about how this, um, how this developed. And then in ancient Egypt, how there were certain people that they were called the netters were a certain class who were still able to access like the pure, the, the, or work with their brain in the way that they purely perceive the energies without having to, with, without doing that process that causes this thing that is like the personification, right? That, that, that you were speaking of earlier. So it made me think of that. And then you had said something about, you talked about lightning earlier, right? About opening up certain, like, I guess I understood it as like dimensions or, or certain energy fields or whatever. Um, and there's this TV show <coughs> that I've been watching called Manifest, right? Um, I actually finished the series. I think there's another season coming. And it's about this airplane that basically took off from Jamaica uh, and supposedly disappeared, but reappeared five years later. And everybody on the ground had, you know, aged five years. But the people who had been, they thought they were just on a plane ride. They didn't realize they had been gone for more than the six hours it took to fly from Jamaica to New York, right? And they got into this idea of like dark lightning and then certain chemical elements and in the, or stones and in this case sapphire is somehow creating a, an energy field that like seemed to disappear and reappear people right could you just you'd mentioned something about lightning earlier related to that um can you flesh that out a little bit for me because it made me think of the show that i had watched and we were kind of having some conversations and some of my groups about that and how relevant you know, that is what does like the energy that you describe in your work, like how does that relate if it does, and maybe it doesn't to something like time travel or portaling or dimension, like, in, you know, interdimensionality or whatnot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, this is where people, some people go into the 4D kind of thinking and 60, 5D, 60, 70 and all this. We'll get into that in a minute. Um but no, the, the lightning is actually produced by these halos. You know, you, you've probably seen the, the lunar wave, the halos, the stationary halos in the sky. Mm -hmm. They're what's producing the lightning that's coming down the way, but the one below it's produces the lightning that goes up the way. You know, each one of them's got a cone pointing. The, the one above's got a cone pointing down, and the one below's got a cone pointing up. So in the middle, they will meet somewhere, which is somewhere just below the surface. That's why you're only seeing part of the tornado or half a rainbow. You know, the, the other part of the process is going on below. So that's where lightning's coming from. Now, how, you know, I'm not sure what the question was again. You know, can we interact with that? Is that what you can ask? And, you know, can we interact with this construct? That's something I can't answer. I think we can, but we can, you know, it's again, how would you prove it? But 
you know, the way we work, we're, we are electrical beings, electromagnetic beings. We're part of this construct. It's all around us. Can we manipulate it? I don't know. I I would like to know that myself, but how do you, you know, what field do you go down to start finding those kind of things out? You know, we, we, we've we looked into a lot, lots of things over the years, haven't we, Juan? You know, we, you know we've done, um, what was that thing, one with the Eiffel Tower again? Oh, the remote viewing, yeah. Yeah, you know, we've played around with things like that. <laughs> but, you know, we can't, you can use it and you can get it right as well, you know, which was a surprise. <laughs> it surprised me that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I was one unknown to me, one conscience, and some others in our group were already doing this, and I, I knew nothing about it. And one had given them a target. And then she asked me about it, and I was trying to put her off the whole thing by saying, Well, anyone can make that up. And I says, You know, I started describing something which turned out to be one's target. <laughs> 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 well, actually, actually, what he said was, Oh, anybody could do this. and so it's something and he said eiffel tower and i said oh hmm you just guessed the target right on point <laughs> he was like well the way the, the way oh. I it was, you know, I'm, a, I'm a tall structure and made of steel i'm in a foreign land that speaks a funny yeah. language i was going through it that way and saying you know this is how you could trick someone right but and then it's and then what it turns out it was actually one consciousness tag it should give to the people that was i wasn't even aware of <laughs> yeah, <she tricked> you. <laughs> Well, actually, the, the remote viewing was quite successful, in my opinion, because not only that incident, but lots of others, and myself included, described places that there's no way we could know what they looked like at all. Yeah, no, I mean, but you know, what we, but the difference being with this was, but someone in the group had seen it, and we were naming, well, explaining what they saw with their eyes. Whereas in the case of the construct, none of us has physically gone out there and seen it. So we can't give that as a target. You know, I've tried that. We're trying to go beyond what we the, the areas we know of, and we can't because we've never been there to show it or see it. So, so, so we're kind of restricted. You know, to me, it, it works. Yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree with one. It does work. It surprised me how accurate some people were. But we're not seeing the outside of this because none of us have seen it physically with our eyes, and we can't project it across, you know, for want of better wording. However, it works. We can't get that image across or get people to explore beyond there to share tell us what they see. Because even if they did, you know, I see a lot of channels proclaiming to see things on Antarctica. But what they're describing is not the technology we're explaining. <clears throat> so, you know, some of them probably make it up. So, so remote viewing is really interesting, right? It's something that I've looked into for a number of years. It's something that I have, uh, in a certain sense, like instinctively done for all of my life. Um, there's different techniques and different styles and different things it can be used for. But like, for example, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. When Jeff, my friend Jeff, who, who I do some shows with sometimes, when we went to this area of Chatsworth I was telling you about earlier, a couple of years ago, right? We did a, you know, by this point, I had already determined that there was something funny going on there and that it, it had affected me as a child. So we went back there just to basically do like an energy clearing session. And he does a practice that's called hollow, hollow fractal replay, which is sort of in some ways related to holographic kinetics, right? So we're there and he was kind of using me as a sort of surrogate for the session, but my mind immediately starts to try and view what's under the ground. This was a couple of years back. It was before I was aware of your work, maybe even before you had that stuff going on the YouTube channel, it was you know, several years back. And par during part of the session, I was like, dude, there's a particle accelerator under there. And I saw it and I described it to him. Right. And then a couple of years later, when we went back and that's when we discovered the, the information about the cave paintings that I showed you earlier, of course, like the paintings showed almost exactly what I had seen. Right. And so you can get pretty accurate descriptions sometimes by, by going and just standing on the land of a place, which obviously you can't go to every place you're interested in. Um, but sometimes someone someone can go. Right. So that's an interesting thing um, that happens. And then. Um, when I looked at your work, I recognized it from visions that I've had in my own mind, on my own back of my own eyelids, and that's a form of remote viewing too. And so when I found your work, it was verification for mine and mine for yours, because how is it yeah. that you don't know each other, right? And I didn't have any, I, I don't know, I didn't know anything about half of the things you talk about, some of the things I did. 
but why is it that I'm seeing the same thing as in my mind that you've spent hours creating graphs to describe? <laughs> We've had that question asked to us, uh, I couldn't tell you many times. You know, it's uh, the, the way a lot of people would. How, how did you get inside my head, take this out and put it into this map and model? Totally. I mean, it's it, like, it's really quite <laughs> fascinating. And then the other, the third thing is uh, just a few weeks back, my friend, Robert Phoenix, who I do a lot of shows with, he had an event and, um, you know, I, I was doing a presentation at his event. So I was there and I participated in some of the activities and one of them was a remote viewing exercise. And, um, you know, I have some experience with that, although I would never say that I'm an expert remote viewer or that, you know, I'm super proficient, but I've had a lot of uh, you know, things come through that, that panned out. So uh, everybody did the exercise and I'd say, it, it, you know, he basically was, um, you know, ha having people, you know, he had drawn some things on a paper that nobody saw and he was having people, you know, he was having people draw things and, and the vast number were either were pretty close resemblances of the various drawings he did, right? On one of mine, like, right, and so all mine were sort of in the neighborhood, except for one that, like, didn't make any sense at all, right? But then none of them were exact, although they were in the neighborhood. And actually, the, I can't remember the details of what it was, but one of the things I drew, like, actually related to, to something from your guys' work, right? And when we were done with the exercise, I happened to check my phone and, and look at the YouTube and you guys were just posting something that the image that was showing on the YouTube thumbnail was exactly what I had drawn, right? You just posted it during the time that, that we were doing the <laughs> exercise. So that's interesting. And then the next day we went out to this like survival course, right? And when we got to the survival course, the sign for the, the company that was doing it, their logo, if you took all of the pieces that I had drawn for the five different things he had made at targets and you put them together, it was the logo. Ooh, nicer. Right? <laughs> so it, yeah, it, that, does, that doesn't surprise me, Emily. You know, we know nothing about ourselves and what we're capable of, do we? We, don't, we know absolutely nothing about this construct yet. We're scratching the surface, you know. Once over, a few years ago, my mind was closed to all these things that we're talking about currently. And I would try and keep it over this research as well, wouldn't I? Wouldn't I one? You know, I says we've got to keep it real. Yes. You know, we've got to, we've got to, you know, we're working with a map and a model, which is, you know, very important. And this, you know, the the topic itself and what's going on and how they've hit it. That's very important and very special. So we've got to be careful what we attach to that. But since you know, since then days, it doesn't worry me anymore looking into all these other avenues because they have to be explored. We can't get, you know, we, we might never get all the answers, but it doesn't mean you can't explore them. Because we know nothing. Yeah. So maybe like the last the, the last couple of things I wanted to ask you about here is, you know, um, I did see you guys had left some some comments in the last video I did. And I, I know that you, that um, uh, UFPV for sure. And I haven't spoken with you before one. So I don't know, have watched some of my stuff, you know, over the last year or two or a couple of years. And I know Sandra does. Um, and A, I'm honored that you watch. I love when like people who I appreciate their work enjoy mine as well. But also I would like to know, like, as I continue with this, because like, I'm pretty fixated on exploring my local reality here, both on a physical and metaphysical and conscious level and, and whatnot. And is there anything that I'm getting wrong or anything that I should consider in the way that I'm sort of applying the knowledge that, that, um, that might be advice or just, you know, or is it just continue doing it the way I'm doing it because it's unique to me and interesting. But I'm just curious as you, you know, when you look at the things that I've said and the way I've applied it, like, how's it going? <laughs> oh, perfect. You know, <laughs> the way, right. the way, you, the way you worded it in that, uh, that one that we used on the, the, the video I uploaded. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. You got it bang on. You know, I couldn't have worded right. it better myself. You worded it better than I probably would. <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're not you know we're not the best at giving it the words. You know, we've got to say you're the same. We we've got to find the words to give it and explain it properly. And you'll explain it maybe a little bit different to us, but it still comes out the same. You still tell the same story. You know, you'll probably word it to Americanize it or you know put your own little take on it, but it's still the same thing. No, you couldn't. You know, you worded it perfect. And the same with your last video, you know, there's a couple of things you, you, you probably need a little bit of work on, but I wouldn't worry about that. You, you, you know, you've, got, you've, got, you've gone down the right avenue. You know, there's something there and there's something tangible you can experiment with, experiment with and find locally to yourself.
And you know, if 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 we can help to accelerate that, we'll help you uh, accelerate. So, yeah, I, I, people, have, people have accused me of being a particle accelerator, you know, with all of the energy and nonstop talking and moving and all of that kind of stuff. So did you have something to add, uh, one? Uh, no, I think you do a really good job explaining it also. Um, I think that, you know, so I come from more of a Wiccan uh, spiritual background, uh -huh. you know, and that was brought on by my own self. It wasn't how I was raised. But I was not raised in a religious atmosphere either. But I think the best way that we could attempt to communicate with whatever it is, you know, like under the surface mm -hmm. would be maybe go out to these spots and and kind of exchange energies yep. in a way. You know, I think that that's the only way I could think of in, in my mind that we could even attempt communication yeah. You know, I'm sure I, if there's another way, I don't know. I mean, we can't go down under the ground and, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I agree with you. And that's part of the reason why I, unless I absolutely can't because of scheduling or weather, I go out, the, uh, there's, li there's this trail right out in front around the lake, around the river. It's a river that's dammed into a lake, right? And I go out there and I sort of like almost pretend like the loop is a circular particle accelerator. And I, in, so I don't go the same direction or the same amount of distance every day, but I'm out there, like, you know, exchanging energy with it, leaving my sweat, right, running on it, feeling what it feels like, letting it feel me, observing the way the people are behaving, observing the artwork that pops up around it, observing, observing, observing. Um, and I think you're right, right? Like, there yeah. is, there, there is a, a point sometimes um, where, like, I'll be focused in on an area for quite a while. And then on a certain day, the area decides, okay, we trust you now. We're going to let you see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. 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 That, you know, all around us. And also when we do locate these special locations, like where our rainbows are mm -hmm. or where we can find the magnetics to show us the boundary, mm -hmm. you know, maybe sitting in that spot also. Mm -hmm. or walking it or whatever it is that we want to do to try to have a communication with the energy flows mm -hmm. you know that's all that's the only thing i could think of are that we, would you know make are, we, are we even thinking and speaking in the correct language anymore because language right. has changed every reset languages get changed you know that's probably why there's so many world languages that are different now it's we start all over again basically every 400 year now in europe and in, in the ancient times welsh was the most used language. Yeah. Uh, and say, you know, that glyphs, everything is the biggest, all this language in Europe. So it showed you it was quite widespread at the time, that language. And when you listen to it, it's not that much different than from people in the Middle East. Now they talk and probably the rest of the world, when you think about it, I don't think there was that much difference between how they communicated. Because, you know, we, we know they were trading more than we're told. You know, I've, I've metal detected myself and I've found things from the other side of the world and thought, how the hell did they get here? <laughs> you know, so clearly, you know, there were trade, there was trade routes and all kinds of going on. So we were more civilized and advanced than mainstream are letting on. That's what it's telling me. So and you can and you can see it in you know the sacred geometry, it's all there. They were smart people, the ancients, and they're very good teachers as well. So I want to ask you a question about time about about sort of I don't know, like realities, multiple realities, like when you said. Okay, if we're seeing something, a rainbow above ground here, we only see half of it. So the other half is below the ground, right? We've been presented with like the idea in Stranger Things of the Upside Down. Obviously, we've heard of the underworld. I've been obsessed with taking these pictures of on certain days when there's a certain energy and a certain, it's hard to explain, but like in Los Angeles, we call it earthquake weather, right? Like you just, there's this odd feeling and odd stillness you can actually see the entirety of the city of Austin reflected perfectly upside down in the lake. And I'm coming to the belief that there is an exact inverted city of Austin under the ground. Um, do, do you think that, I, I mean, have you, what do you think of that idea? Is there like another reality that is similar but different or exactly inverted or, you know, some kind of, 
you know, opposite or, or maybe even just the exact same copy upside down where another one of ex us exists down there as well. And, and, and you, can it be accessed and, and what happens if it does, like you guys play with these concepts. What do you think of something like that? Um, we have, we have thought of that before, you know, when you look into the duality of things, but you know, it's, you probably have to go down there and see it for yourself to prove that. Now we know from ancient times that it's cities below ground. You know, there's a lot more below ground than we realize. Uh, you know, cathedrals. There's been cathedrals found below okay. ground. Mm -hmm. So they're all, you know, there's always been our ancestors have always went below ground, haven't they? So you know, without exploration, we can't really go any further. On is it a, an exact replica of what's above? Probably, probably. You know, I would say no, because you know we're more more modern and we build different now to what they did in the ancient times. But it's still using part of the same grid, the same ley lines, everything. You know, they, they build around this circuit. We yes. know that. You know, every city is where it is because of what's below there. And they can tap into it. So here's one picture. This isn't the, necessarily the best one I have, but it's the easiest one that I could just access. I just look for it real fast and this popped up, right? Like I can get pictures like this from different angles on certain days, right? Um, and it really gives one pause to wonder, right? <laughs> like when you see something like this, right? And then the interesting thing sometimes is to go out paddle boarding on the lake when it's this clear like that. And when I'm in, I mean, it's almost hard to tell which is the real and which is the lake. But when we're paddle boarding in the lake and I look into what is supposedly the reflection of the clouds, Sometimes I'm able to find definition and, and structure in the cloud, in the water that you can't see in the one in the sky, right? Which can be really disorienting and really begin to ask yourself like a lot of questions, right? <laughs> um, so this was just an example of kind of, you know, what I was talking about there. Um, I do see things that I consider to be possible entrances to the underground and I like, right. It, it, and, and obviously I know that anybody can climb down a sewer pipe or whatever. I'm uniquely familiar with some of these areas around Austin and what they've been used for over time. And, and I think that there is entrance to another space uh, right out front of my, my place that I live, you know, in, in this general area. And it's one of these things that I'm sort of um, considering further exploration of, like, I don't know if it's trying to build up the courage or if it's try, uh, finding the right uh, partner to travel with me to do it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, you know, like, I feel like, um, you know, in a previous iteration of my life, but by that, I mean this life just tw 21 years ago, I lived here and I had a set of experiences that I've been struggling to understand ever since then. And I think some of them may have involved being taken to some of these spaces. So I feel like based on that, I have sort of a, a, a birthright or like an energetic right to sort of understand the experiences and this exploration is part of that. So it's something I play with um, the idea of um, and, you know, uh, but I like, I, you know, I, I don't think I would have thought to really do it in the way I'm thinking of doing it now without understanding your work and what you've said about some of these rooms, some of these sarcophagi, some of these underground space, some of these spaces, right. And what, mm -hmm. what, what may be there. Um, and then the other thing is time travel. What do you, do you, does that come up for you guys as you look into some of this stuff? What are your thoughts on that? How does that relate if it does or if it doesn't? And then I want to offer a theory that my mind keeps wanting to, 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 to tell you. My take on it is it doesn't work. Otherwise we wouldn't be sitting having this conversation now. Yeah. <laughs> I would be long gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, probably one as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, no, I, um, I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible. I have no idea. You know, I don't, it probably needs explored. Can it be done? It's, I wouldn't know where to start with that, to be honest. But I think if it was possible, they'd be using it and we wouldn't be talking today, I don't think. If, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be talking today, not just us. <laughs> They've got a lot of enemies, these people, not just people in this arena. So sometimes, and, and this has been a, just since I've been back here and I've been sort of finding connection points to experiences I had back when I first moved here 21 years ago, 
Um, and I've had a couple of things come up, but one just came sort of during this conversation, right? And, um, you know, we're sitting here talking about this and um, I have found your work and, I, and I'm learning about it and I understand it in a particularly unique way that has helped me to explain it to other people. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I like about you, Emily. You're not scared to go there. What you'll find in flat Earth, people are scared to even pick up this topic, Sorry. which is well, which surprised me because we came, you know, we came here to find out what this world is and how it works. And you know, over the past five years, that's what we've been doing. We've been proving it's a technological construct. Now, you'd be surprised how many people in flat Earth are scared to touch this subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How are they going to explain how it works without lo- even looking at it? All right, well, you know, really gonna well, go you know what, right what, what we can prove is it's technology, can't we? You know, we've seen the halos in the heavens. Yeah, well, I'm really going to go there right now. All right. So mm-hmm. it has dawned on me because I've had a few other things come up about this in the same sort of time frame, right? That what I'm experiencing right now, right? Everything I'm experiencing right now, I got vision of back 21 years ago. Like I thought maybe they were dreams or like weird, I don't know, you know how sometimes you just have like flashes or thoughts or weird stuff. I could never figure out what these these experiences were that I was trying to understand. So it come um, under the class of like a premonition then, yeah? Premonition or just like weird, like some sort of like, was I in a hypno- hypnotized state? Was it a dream? Is it a memory? Like, what is it, right? Like, I yeah. had this thing in my head that I couldn't figure out. And then I find myself in a place now, this time that I'm here, and I'm looking at the thing that I had been trying to find for so many years based on a vision or a dream or something I'd had back then. And uh, I did a couple of episodes where Michael and I have gotten into some of these, and it's been fascinating what I've turned up. And some of it relates to... Um, this process called the gateway experience that was uh, something that was done by the Monroe Institute Um, and it's basically a um, it has to do with uh, remote viewing and astral travel and being able to move forward and backwards in time and there is a program a a level of the program called gateway 21 that is about basically traveling what seems to be maybe 21 a certain number of years into the future maybe 21 and like looking around and then bringing, doing recognizance and then bringing that information back, right? And so if I was in a project or a program that employed this technique, right? Then some of the things that I've been talking about now, right? Like if I had first access to them then, like I was coming in and exploring what my life would be in 21 years and then going back and reporting on that, right? And I didn't understand what was really happening because that's how these projects and programs work. Like the same understanding that that I, I've demonstrated that I'm helping the people who are trying to understand your material and listening to my shows, like the way I'm sort of able to uh, condense it or compress it and explain it in a way that more people can understand or whatnot. Like maybe it's this conversation that I reported on back in the past that's informed some of what's going on around here right now, right? That there's um, this, you know, ability for some people to, and, and, you know, one, you might understand this based on the, the Wiccan, the, the Wiccan tendencies that, that you've claimed, right? To sort of move forward and backward in time to sort of gather information. And, and if you're doing that for yourself, it's one thing, but if it's something that's happening to, somebody, you know, a kid that's in a, in a program or a project or being used for a certain, for a certain something and it's outside of their complete awareness. I'm sure you're familiar with these, these abilities. Sometimes I find myself smack dab living in the middle of the thing I saw 21 years ago. Um, and I, when I'm thinking about this conversation and like another show I did with Nish and Michael Walker where like the conversation became something that I had had a foggy memory of years before that, right? And it's like, it seems like it's reverse in time. And the thing that could, could explain that would only be, you know, the kind of remote viewing that travels back and forth in time or actual time travel itself. So that's just uh, what my brain is wanting to do with some of this today, valid or not. I, I've also been accused of, you know, uh, ridiculous fantasies, but I enjoy them. And so, <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah, I think, see, I, yeah, for the time travel thing, I don't know if it's physically 
possible for our body to be transported to another time and us walk around and touch stuff now our energy and our minds to go forward and see what the future may hold i think could be possible Mm -hmm. because we have way more potential than what we know Mm -hmm. in our minds and you know did we already lay out our our life map Mm -hmm. you know and when we were in our spirit form you know, those are all questions that we can't answer, but I believe to be true. You know, I believe that when we're in our spirit form, that we can lay out our lives, our challenges, our defeats and our wins, you know. So therefore, somewhere in our DNA or our mind, we would know already what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then can we tap into that? Yeah, I think in certain states we can. Yeah. You know, but I don't really think that it's possible for somebody to get into a machine and travel forward in time with their full physical body. You know, that would probably kill us, (laughs) kill our body. But I think that our energy can see into the future. You know, that's like how people do tarot card readings. They have premonitions and all of that stuff is recorded. You know, people can record that these things have happened to them. Um, You know, stuff like that. That's what I think. I mean, you know, that experience when like you return to some place where like something wonderful or something terrible happened and you can like feel that same energy that you felt like the the time it happened, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you can do that backwards, like if every time you go to the place where you had a the terrible fight with your boyfriend that led to the breakup. If every time you pass that place, you sort of feel that energy again, why wouldn't you also be able to, why wouldn't that go the other way forward as well? Right? So like when you're standing yeah. in some place, why wouldn't you be able to sort of see out or project what your future like experience at that spot might be? Right? It, it, it yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it does to me. You know, yeah. not to everybody, but I think that, yeah, that we know more than we know, <laughs> you know if that makes sense. The, like the same, we the same, good. No, I was just, just what I said. I mean, we know somewhere in our minds or, you know, our DNA, the past and the future. I think that we hold a lot more than what we think we do, you know, especially with our DNA in the past, why wouldn't we know these things? We have the DNA of all of our ancestors in our bodies. Yep. You know, they call it junk DNA, but what happens if it's activated? Same with our mind. Why couldn't we see what's going to happen in the future if we yeah. tap into those parts of the brain that are shut down most of the time? Yeah, um, I, I, you know. I agree with you. I I mean, I think they probably do try to send people with machines or technologies into the future. And I think it probably doesn't go pretty well. Um, We saw it. If you guys watch that show, The Man in the High Castle, right? Like almost everybody who they tried to move to the other realities, you know, didn't make it, right? Um, But there was like a metaphysical way to do it. Um, I've always thought if there is a time travel device, it is the DNA, right? Like it's more of like an internal time travel, right? Like it's like a going inwards kind of time travel. And I think that might be one of the reasons why they're so hell bent on fucking with the DNA, right? And the RNA and, and whatever, right? Is to, um, to, to hide either to you know, remove that ability or to hijack it or to, um, you know, like tag a passenger on so that everything can be surveilled in a different way if it's happening. Um, and then what you said about the junk DNA, right? Like think about you have like a grandparent that maybe has a lot of junk, like you might call them a hoarder and you're just like, fuck, throw your shit away. Right. But then like one day you decide to go through it after they've passed and like, oh my God, the things that are in here, right? Like I was calling it junk, but like, this gives me the answers I've been looking for my whole life. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's also the thing with the vaccinations, isn't there? Everyone got vaccinated at school. What did it actually do? What was in it? I don't yeah. believe what they, I don't believe what they say was in it anymore. Yeah. So you say, you know, what have they have they disabled something in our bodies from working? We have no idea what's going on, have we? Absolutely no idea what's going on, apart from we know we're being harmed and they're hiding this construct. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too, because when we're kids, it seems like we have a lot more no mm-hmm. in us. 
and then you know we get vaccinated which most people did get vaccinated and you know a lot of that starts to shut down yeah yeah i mean and and now they want to do it younger and younger and more and more right like there was a time when it was like very few and spread out right and now it's like as many as possible like before they even leave the hospital and i mean i think the amount that my like seven-year-old nephew has had you know is like far exceeds any like i mean i stopped at a certain point once i realized what was going on doing any of that stuff but before that you did the ones when you were younger and then when you traveled internationally right so he had more of the first year or two of his life than i had in my you know entire life right and it's just um more and more and more and you know the other thing did you guys ever have these things when you were like in elementary school where they had you and the story was to so you could see the plaque on your teeth but like put some red tablet in your mouth and swish it with water do you guys remember this and 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 then oh, no. it, like, it made these like so a, a couple people that i've talked to remember this kind of ex- exper- experience experience or experiment in elementary school right about these weird red tablets and um and then complete loss of time right and then you know from there forward maybe like the more just not not feeling so um, constrained by the school experience or not feeling so much the need to ask why and like what was really in the tablet dude <laughs> right right I mean that would make sense yeah what what are they doing <laughs> yeah you know and and um yeah I think it school is a weird thing right like it's we just accept it you know, um, we just accept that like, this is a normal thing. You become five years old, you go to kindergarten before that you may have gone to preschool. And after that you do all these years of school and whatnot, but how many, like what would have happened to us if we didn't go to school? Like everyone's like, oh, you would be stupid. You wouldn't know anything. You couldn't get a job. Da, da, da. Like I'd say that most people these days are stupid. Don't know anything. Can't get a job. <laughs> right? So it's like, it happens. Right. I'm, I'm being, I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm being a little exaggerative, but it's like, you know, we have no, um, we have no barom- we have nothing to measure that against, right? The only people that we know that don't do those things are people that live like in an entirely different kind of reality than we do that we don't understand. So we can't even judge if they're intelligent or not. Right. And I think that the the kids that like okay, so kids that seem to ask more questions and think mm-hmm. more for themselves, they seem to be the ones that really hate school. Mm-hmm. You know, that they, they just despise going there and they think it's very boring. And and the kids that tend to be more brainwashed from a young age by their parents and not really thought to think for themselves, they don't mind it so much. Yeah. You know, but it does not make that child stupid. It actually makes them more intelligent because they're willing to look into things for themselves as to why do things happen. And the only reason that they may not be able to get a job is society. You know, it doesn't mean that they can't learn things and be self-educated. You know, I graduated high school. I have a high school diploma. I didn't go to college, but I've self-educated myself on many, many subjects, you know, especially since starting this research. I've learned things that I should have PhDs for, you know, right. <laughs> if I went to college. Yeah. But, you know, it, it just... I don't, you know, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> I'm the only person in my family that doesn't have a PhD, right? I did not graduate from college. I probably have had enough units, but I never did them in like one discipline because I was scattered all over the place trying to find something desperately that might interest me so I could do the thing that everyone told me I was supposed to do, but, you know, it didn't really work. Um, but, you know, it's inter- like, I'm the black sheep of the family. Like, you know, I don't understand what's going on with Emily over there. She has all these crazy ideas and blah, 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 right? But, you know, and, and my sister is a professor at a university. And so they understand that world, right? But, you know, I've produced as much or more material, original material than my sister has a much as much analytical material. But, some, you know, for some reason, it doesn't count. Right. You know, I've spent as many hours pouring over documents and going through stuff and whatnot. But, you know, it's that's fine for me. Like, I'm not prison to a certain sort of structure of reality that she you know, is. Right. She's in she's in a certain prison. She's, um, you know, that maybe she doesn't even recognize. But. Totally. Like, I think all of us on some level, I don't know if I want a PhD, but if there was one that wasn't a mind control one, we all deserve one several times over. <laughs> well, there's nothing, you yeah. know, the good, news, the good news is there's nothing at school can even prepare you for this, let alone, let alone help you decode it, really. You know, all you need to work with this really is to be able to read and write and have some discernment. Yeah. 
That's all you need in, in life. Everything else is just nonsense, you know. Reading, like the three R's, as used to call it, reading, writing, arithmetic. Just get, that's all you need. Them three, some discernment, you'll get by fine in life. So, <laughs> right, uh, you know, all, all, all this stuff they're teaching in universities, and it's just, you don't need it, you know. It's just only the scientific uh, parts of it. I mean, you know, you need, obviously you need some for certain jobs and things, but... The science alone, you know, can you prove your claims, what you're claiming, what you've been taught? No, you can't. You just repeat what someone else has told you is true. Yep. So what you've learned is you're going to find is nonsense. Yep. So I wouldn't pay a penny to for a PhD. It's not much use in the real world. Totally. I'm, yeah. I, unfortunately, I paid a lot of pennies for <laughs> for none. But yes, I learned <laughs> I, I learned a different lesson. Uh -huh. All right, guys. Well, let's. I'm gonna like let's wrap this up. I'm um. Before we go, I would I want to ask because I know like last year when I first asked for an interview, we didn't do it then because I think your grandchild wasn't well. One um, is everything okay? Um, yeah, she's on the mend. She had her open heart surgery, and um, you know she saw some issues, but she's doing well. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, I, it was a pleasure to get to talk with you guys today. I'm hoping we will get to do it. Um, again sometime in the future I, I hold you guys in the highest respect I, I really appreciate your work um, it's helping me understand my own journey my own reality and whatnot so uh, from the bottom of my, my heart and my spirit and my soul thank you and before we go is there anything else you want to say to the people I would say we're the, probably the best advisors, advisors you're ever going to come across when it comes to this construct and how it works so use that wisely and ask the right questions. Awesome. One, anything from you? Um, <laughs> I guess just keep an open mind, you know, when you're learning things. Don't walk into it closed-minded. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to link that 144,000 uh, video in the description. For this, um, I, I'm going to figure out uh, the best day to release this so that we, I can do a premiere, so I can be in the the comments, set, the, the chat with people, and I can let you guys know when I'm going to put it out. So if you can or want to be there for that, you can as well. And then after that sits for a couple of days, if you guys want to include this, I know some of the interviews you've done, you take them and include them in your live streams. You're you're free to to for surely do that, and hopefully we'll have many more conversations in the future. So thank you. Oh, but before we, before we end, let's just plug yeah. Operation Rainbow Warrior because it's important. You know, this is a chance okay. for every. This is a chance for all of you people out there to join in. Doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, you can join in with this and help us get them on the map and prove what we're saying. Okay, so can you tell people real quick what that is, and I'll include the little video that you made directly for it underneath as well, but just give it a little plug. Okay, well, the, the reason for Operation Rainbow War is what we discovered in the 144,000 video, that the rainbow is actually revolving around the halo below. So it's a perfect way of, it's the, you know, it's the signature of an angel, basically. It's the electromagnetic pro. It's the electric process of electromagnetism, the rainbow. That's doing the electrical part, the halo below, on the one above are doing the magnetic and electric processes, but and the rainbow is is what forms in between them, and it go it basically revolve around the halo below, so that's why you only see half of it. It's revolving around the accelerator below. It's just following the flow around the halo. So if you time lapse it on a camera, you will see it revolving slowly or quickly. It depends, you know, if you get strong winds, obviously it's revolving a bit faster. So a fast-moving rainbow on time-lapse, you, you should see windy environments. A slow-moving one, ah. it'll be calm. So they control the winds. Ah. So okay. that's, you know, the, the wind is a good indicator, you know. So, one, you know, if you look under the Operation Rainbow Warrior, the first video, in the pinned comments, I'll put some criteria in there and also some tips. And then tips can be added to it as we find out more and more and, you know, make it even easier for people. Like I've just said, then, you know, that now no... It's these that's generating the wind locally. All your local winds are generated by these locally. Okay. They're all local. They're all localized events. You know, you're actually standing, everyone's standing in electromagnetic fields of different frequencies, basically. That's where we really are. And once you see them all over the map, you're going to see, you know, like little domes here, there, and everywhere on the map. <laughs> well, not, not the domes the flat earthers talk about in the sky. No, I know what you're these talking are, about. These yeah. are ones that just cover like the size of a city, say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there is, there's, 
um everybody people are looking for like some kind of glass dome or sky ice dome no these are electromagnetic domes that like yeah. i can see this is another thing you can see when you go and you do the mushrooms like out in the desert you can see exactly like where the the dome is and and then you can see there's almost like this geometric energetic wallpaper that like that covers the the ceiling all around you right that sort of mm -hmm. is the the geometry of how it's being projected there um so i know exactly what you're talking about and and you know and without using drugs of any kind when you see a double rainbow look below it and you will see part of the dome that the color of the dome you know you've seen a purple one yeah we've seen that we've seen orange one so it changes that dome color changes and you know it's going to go through the visible spectrum so that's interesting that's somewhat else we need to add to that list what color was the was the, dome. the um was well let's not call it a dome because i hate that word it's it's got such bad reputation in flat earth because people imagine there's a dome above them you know we can't prove there is there isn't yet but until someone proves there is one we're saying no we haven't got proof of that so we don't entertain it but you know like i said before we're talking an electromagnetic sphere around right. coming, coming from this technology and you know we only see half of it and your rainbow wraps around it basically okay so, like, what color is the wallpaper on the energetic? Uh, yeah, what color is the what color is the inner field? You yeah. know, the inside field of the double rainbow. You'll see it's it's in contrast to the background. It'll be a totally different color. It'll be orange, purple. You know, all kinds of colors are going to appear red even. And this is probably you know this is an APM first here, a little exclusive for your channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is where these different moon colors and phases are coming from. You know, your, your blue moon. Yep. Things like your blue moon, or you know, it, it relates to certain colors in some cases. Now we've got waveforms overlapping the moon, which create the phases. Yirahu and Ketu, and Ketu are certain waveforms that cross the map and they overlap. You know, the luminaries are causing phases and eclipses. So, you know, these can also be. If that color changes, we would like to know. You know, you're seeing it purple at the moment, or in, or indigo or violet. I think you said it was. Yep. You know, these are the colors. These are the colors from the spectrum Walter Russell works with, and awesome. we'd like to, we'd like to know if it's always that color, or you know, does it change over time? I think it, I think we'll see changes over time, and that's why you get these. Oh, it's a blood moon tonight. Why? Because they're all turning red all of a sudden. Uh -huh. And where? Uh, and also to check out, you know, where is seeing this red moon? Because I've seen people go online and say, "I'm looking at a red moon." Well, I'm looking at outside, and it's not red to me. So, what in this part of the world made it go red? It's obviously a localized event, isn't it? Yeah. They're seeing, they're seeing through an electromagnetic field and it's portraying it as red. So there could be a waveform or overlap or, or occlusion there that's caused that color shift. So I'm just going to show you real quick, like what I see, like on the way, like when I'm generally like at this time of year, I've been running, you know, in the late afternoon, early evening. And when I'm heading back close to home, this is what I see over on the east side. Mm -hmm right? Almost every night, right? At the same time, yeah. this kind of color, this kind of color. And then um, if I'm looking at uh, the other, if I'm looking towards the other, the other side of town, then um, it, this is what you see. The, in the other direction is kind of looking like this. Maybe this is a tad bit later, so it's a bit darker, um, but you'll see something like this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the purple and the orange, very prominent, right? You get some pink. Some that's what, yeah, that's what I was going to say to you when you're, do, when you're doing your rainbow hunting. Mm -hmm. Make sure that make sure they put the sun behind you and look, look, you know, say the sun was behind you in this photo now. You want right. to be looking ahead for rain showers. Wherever it's raining, try and get the sun behind you, and then you'll start seeing the rainbows where they are. Okay. You want the sun, you want the sun behind you. I mean, I mean, you'll see them in front of you, in between you and the sun will be rainbows but because because of the sun's brightness it's sometimes hard to see them but if you turn the other way put your back to the sun and just look off into the distance at any rain showers so if it's raining there where you where that places you want to check try and go to a, a, an advantage point where you're looking down on the place you know from a from a height okay with, with the sun behind you and see see if you detect the rainbows you know take a camera and time lapse it and you'll you, you will see it revolving it just they just revolve where they live you know they basically live there permanently all right. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. And um, uh, to the listeners, thank you for, for tuning in. I hope you found this uh, interesting and enlightening. And I couldn't urge you more to go check out their work. There are at this point are literally hundreds of thousands of hours of content. 
and they're streaming almost all the time. So even if you just have like 10 or 15 minutes, pop in, see what they're doing, you'll learn something. They have it sort of separated out into digestible chunks, even though they sort of stream them all back to back. You can catch one little segment one time, another segment another time. And also there's beautiful videos and photographs and graphics and people hanging out in the chat room who are funny and interesting. So, you know, whatever, whatever you kind of go there for, you're going to have an enjoyable experience. So thanks so much for your work, guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, to the listeners, we'll see you next time. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Bye, everyone. Yep, thank you. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have researched and decoded over the last five years is going to blow your minds. Our research has been a rolling research and decode of various subjects that link so many important things together. It has helped us decode a great many things others are actively involved in trying to steal from us right now. You can find our journey and research on my channel. All time and date stamped, what you will find is our raw, honest, genuine grassroots research which has progressed and expanded our knowledge in a great many fields, which will all challenge mainstream narratives. What this team has achieved over the years is incredible beyond belief, but is very real, very serious and very now. This world is not what we have been told. APM research can now decode the world's sacred geometry and we can explain and reference what it is actually relating to. This amazing technological construct of which the blueprints are everywhere when decoded correctly. What this means is our ancestors all knew what this world is and how it works. Over time and resets this knowledge has been lost, stolen, reworded and even destroyed in wars. The indoctrination and forcing of religious beliefs has replaced reality. Because now people no longer see or know what the creator's glory actually is. This technological construct. This is the reality we find ourselves in. Reality is not a religion, that is a man-made divide. We see and recognize the Creator's glory in all cultures' depictions, and we are going to help you remember what it all relates to. This knowledge belongs to every human being. It is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, this world is technologically driven as our research keeps proving. The science of Walter Russell really is the science of the angels. I hope you can see the seriousness of this. The future of the human race lies in your awakening.